Chapter 1 Clues from the Past You have some money in the bank. You decide you'd like to buy some common stock. You may have reached this decision because you desire to have more income than you would if you used these funds in other ways. You may have reached it because you want to grow with America. Possibly you think of earlier years when Henry Ford was starting the Ford Motor Company or Andrew Mellon was building up the Aluminum Company of America and you wonder if you couldn't discover some young enterprise which might today lay the groundwork for a great fortune for you too. Just as likely, you are more afraid than hopeful and want to have a nest egg against a rainy day. Consequently, after hearing more and more about inflation, you desire something which will be safe and yet protected from further shrinkage in the buying power of the dollar. Probably, your real motives are a mixture of a number of these things, influenced somewhat by knowing a neighbor who has made some money in the market and possibly by receiving a pamphlet in the mail, explaining just why Midwestern pumpernickel is now a bargain. A single basic motive lies behind all this, however. For one reason or another, through one method or another, you buy common stocks in order to make money. Therefore, it seems logical that before even thinking of buying any common stock, the first step is to see how money has been most successfully made in the past. Even a casual glance at American stock market history will show that two very different methods have been used to amass spectacular fortunes. In the 19th century and in the early part of the 20th century, a number of big fortunes and many small ones were made largely by betting on the business cycle. In a period when an unstable banking system caused recurring boom and bust, buying stocks in bad times and selling them in good had strong elements of value. This was particularly true for those with good financial connections who might have some advance information about when the banking system was becoming a bit strained. But perhaps the most significant fact to be realized is that even in the stock market era, which started to end with the coming of the Federal Reserve System in 1913 and became history with the passage of the Securities and Exchange legislation in the early days of the Roosevelt administration, those who used a different method made far more money and took far less risk. Even in those earlier times, finding the really outstanding companies and staying with them through all the fluctuations of a gyrating market proved far more profitable to far more people than did the more colorful practice of trying to buy them cheap and sell them dear. If this statement appears surprising, further amplification of it may prove even more so. It may also provide the key to open the first door to successful investing. Listed on the various stock exchanges of the nation today are not just a few, but scores of companies in which it would have been possible to invest, say, $10,000 somewhere between 25 and 50 years ago, and today have this purchase represent anywhere from $250,000 to several times this amount. In other words, within the lifetime of most investors and within the period in which their parents could have acted for nearly all of them, there were available scores of opportunities to lay the groundwork for substantial fortunes for oneself or one's children. These opportunities did not require purchasing on a particular day at the bottom of a great panic. The shares of these companies were available year after year at prices that were to make this kind of profit possible. What was required was the ability to distinguish these relatively few companies with outstanding investment possibilities from the much greater number whose future would vary, all the way from the moderately successful to the complete failure. Are there opportunities existing today to make investments that in the years ahead will yield corresponding percentage gains? The answer to this question deserves rather detailed attention. If it be in the affirmative, the path for making real profits through common stock investment starts to become clear. Fortunately, there is strong evidence indicating that the opportunities of today are not only as good as those of the first quarter of this century, but are actually much better. One reason for this 
is the change that has occurred during this period in the fundamental concept of corporate management and the corresponding changes in handling corporate affairs that this has brought about. A generation ago, heads of a large corporation were usually members of the owning family. They regarded the corporation as a personal possession. The interests of outside stockholders were largely ignored. If any consideration at all was given to the problem of management continuity, that is, of training younger men to step into the shoes of those whose age might make them no longer available, the motive was largely that of taking care of a son or a nephew who would inherit the job. Providing the best available talent to protect the average stockholder's investment was seldom a matter in the forefront of the minds of management. In that age of autocratic personal domination, the tendency of aging management was to resist innovation or improvement and frequently to refuse even to listen to suggestions or criticism. This is a far cry from today's constant competitive search to find ways of doing things better. Today's top corporate management is usually engaged in continuous self-analysis and, in a never-ending search for improvement, frequently even goes outside its own organization by consulting all sorts of experts in its effort to get good advice. In former days, there was always great danger that the most attractive corporation of the moment would not continue to stay ahead in its field or, if it did, that the insiders would grab all the benefits for themselves. Today, investment dangers like these, while not entirely a thing of the past, are much less likely to prove a hazard for the careful investor. One facet of the change that has come over corporate management is worthy of attention. This is the growth of the corporate research and engineering laboratory, an occurrence that would hardly have benefited the stockholder if it had not been accompanied by corporate management's learning a parallel technique, whereby this research could be made a tool to open up a golden harvest of ever-growing profits to the stockholder. Even today, many investors seem but slightly aware of how fast this development has come, how much further it is almost certainly going, and its impact on basic investment policy. There is no quick and easy yardstick for either management or the investor to measure the profitability of research. Just as even the ablest professional baseball player cannot expect to get a hit much more often than one out of every three times he comes to bat, so, a sizable number of research projects, governed merely by the law of averages, are bound to produce nothing profitable at all. Furthermore, by pure chance, an abnormal number of such unprofitable projects may happen to be bunched together in one particular span of time in even the best-run commercial laboratory. Finally, it is apt to take from 7 to 11 years from the time a project is first conceived until it has a significant favorable effect on corporate earnings. Therefore, even the most profitable of research projects is pretty sure to be a financial drain before it eventually adds to the stockholder's profit. But if the cost of poorly organized research is both high and hard to detect, the cost of too little research may be even higher. During the next few years, the introduction of many kinds of new materials and new types of machinery will steadily narrow the market for thousands of companies, possibly entire industries, which fail to keep pace with the times. So will such major changes in basic ways of doing things as will be brought about by the adoption of electronic computers for the keeping of records and the use of irradiation for industrial processing. However, other companies will be alert to the trends and will maneuver to make enormous sales gains from such awareness. The managements of certain of such companies may continue to maintain the highest standards of efficiency in handling their day-to-day -day operations while using equally good judgment in keeping ahead of the field on these matters affecting the long-range future. Their fortunate stockholders, rather than the proverbial meek, may well inherit the earth. Before going further, it might be well to summarize briefly the various investment clues that can be gleaned from a study of the past and from a comparison of the major differences, from an investment standpoint, between the past and the present. 
Such a study indicates that the greatest investment reward comes to those who, by good luck or good sense, find the occasional company that, over the years, can grow in sales and profits far more than industry as a whole. It further shows that when we believe we have found such a company, we had better stick with it for a long period of time. It gives us a strong hint that such companies need not necessarily be young and small. Instead, regardless of size, what really counts is a management having both a determination to attain further important growth and an ability to bring its plans to completion. The past gives us a further clue that this growth is often associated with knowing how to organize research in the various fields of the natural sciences, so as to bring to market economically worthwhile and usually interrelated product lines. It makes clear to us that a general characteristic of such companies is a management that does not let its preoccupation with long-range planning prevent it from exerting constant vigilance in performing the day-to-day -day tasks of ordinary business outstandingly well. Finally, it furnishes considerable assurance that, in spite of the very many spectacular investment opportunities that existed twenty-five or fifty years ago. There are probably even more such opportunities available today. Chapter two: What scuttlebutt can do. As a general description of what to look for, all this may be helpful. But as a practical guide for finding outstanding investments, it obviously contributes relatively little. Granted that this furnishes a broad outline of the type of investment that should be sought, how does the investor go about finding the specific company which might open the way to major appreciation? One way that immediately suggests itself is logical but rather impractical. This is to find someone who is sufficiently skilled in the various facets of management to examine each subdivision of a company's organization, and by detailed investigation of its executive personnel, its production, its sales organization, its research, and each of its other major functions, form a worthwhile conclusion as to whether the particular company has outstanding potentialities for growth and development. Such a method may appear sensible. Unfortunately, there are several reasons why it usually will not serve the average investor very well. In the first place, there are only a few individuals who have the necessary degree of top management skill to do a job of this kind. Most of them are busy at top level and high paying management jobs. They have neither the time nor the inclination to occupy themselves in this way. Furthermore, if they were so inclined, it's doubtful if many of the real growth companies of the nation would allow someone outside their own organization to have all the data necessary to make an informed decision. Some of the knowledge gained in this way would be too valuable to existing or potential competition to permit its being passed on to anyone having no responsibility to the company furnishing the data. Fortunately, there is another course which the investor can pursue. If properly handled, this method will provide the clues that are needed to find really outstanding investments. For lack of a better term, I shall call this way of proceeding the scuttlebutt method. As this method is spelled out in detail in the pages that follow, the average investor will have one predominant reaction. This is that, regardless of how beneficial this scuttlebutt method may be to someone else. It is not going to be helpful to him because he just won't have much chance to apply it. I am aware that most investors are not in a position to do for themselves much of what is needed to get the most from their investment funds. Nevertheless, I think they should thoroughly understand just what is needed and why. Only in this way are they in a position to select the type of professional advisor who can best help them. Only in this way can they adequately evaluate the work of that advisor. Furthermore, when they understand not only what can be accomplished but also how it can be accomplished, they may be surprised at how, from time to time, they may be in a position to enrich and make more profitable the worthwhile work already being done for them by their investment advisors. The business grapevine is a remarkable thing. 
It's amazing what an accurate picture of the relative points of strength and weakness of each company in an industry can be obtained from a representative cross-section of the opinions of those who, in one way or another, are concerned with any particular company. Most people, particularly if they feel sure there is no danger of their being quoted, like to talk about the field of work in which they are engaged, and will talk rather freely about their competitors. Go to five companies in an industry, ask each of them intelligent questions about the points of strength and weakness of the other four, and nine times out of ten, a surprisingly detailed and accurate picture of all five will emerge. However, competitors are only one and not necessarily the best source of informed opinion. It's equally astonishing how much can be learned from both vendors and customers about the real nature of the people with whom they deal. Research scientists in universities, in government, and in competitive companies are another fertile source of worthwhile data. So are executives of trade associations. In the case of trade association executives, especially, but to a great extent the other groups as well. It is impossible to lay too much stress on the importance of two matters. The inquiring investor must be able to make clear, beyond any doubt, that his source of information will never be revealed. Then he must scrupulously live up to this policy. Otherwise, the danger of getting an informant into trouble is obviously so great that unfavorable opinions just do not get passed along. There is still one further group which can be of immense help to the prospective investor in search of a bonanza company. This group, however, can be harmful rather than helpful if the investor does not use good judgment and does not do plenty of cross-checking with others to verify his own judgment as to the reliability of what is told him. This group consists of former employees. Such people frequently have a real inside view in regard to their former employer's strength and weakness. Equally important, they will usually talk freely about them. But enough such former employees may, rightly or wrongly, feel they were fired without good cause or left because of a justified grievance. That it's always important to check carefully into why employees left the company being studied. Only then is it possible to determine the degree of prejudice that may exist, and to allow for it in considering what the former employee has to say. If enough different sources of information are sought about a company, there is no reason to believe that each bit of data obtained should agree with each other bit of data. Actually, there is not the slightest need for this to happen. In the case of really outstanding companies. The preponderant information is so crystal clear that even a moderately experienced investor who knows what he is seeking will be able to tell which companies are likely to be of enough interest to him to warrant taking the next step in his investigation. This next step is to contact the officers of the company to try and fill out some of the gaps still existing in the investor's picture of the situation being studied. Chapter three. What to buy? The fifteen points to look for in a common stock. What are these matters about which the investor should learn if he is to obtain the type of investment which, in a few years, might show him a gain of several hundred percent, or over a longer period of time, might show a correspondingly greater increase? In other words, what attributes should a company have to give it the greatest likelihood of attaining this kind of results for its shareholders? There are fifteen points with which I believe the investor should concern himself. A company could well be an investment bonanza if it failed fully to qualify in a very few of them. I do not think it could come up to my definition of a worthwhile investment if it failed to qualify on many. Some of these points are matters of company policy. Others deal with how efficiently this policy is carried out. Some of these points concern matters which should largely be determined from information obtained from sources outside the company being studied, while others are best solved by direct inquiry from company personnel. These fifteen points are: point one, 
Does the company have products or services with sufficient market potential to make possible a sizable increase in sales for at least several years? It is by no means impossible to make a fair one-time profit from companies with a stationary or even a declining sales curve. Operating economies resulting from better control of costs can at times create enough improvement in net income to produce an increase in the market price of a company's shares. This sort of one-time profit is eagerly sought by many speculators and bargain hunters. It does not offer the degree of opportunity, however, that should interest those desiring to make the greatest possible gains from their investment funds. Neither does another type of situation which sometimes offers a considerably larger degree of profit. Such a situation occurs when a changed condition opens up a large increase in sales for a period of a very few years after which sales stop growing. Not even the most outstanding growth companies need necessarily be expected to show sales for every single year larger than those of the year before. In another chapter, I'll attempt to show why the normal intricacies of commercial research and the problems of marketing new products tend to cause such sales increases to come in an irregular series of uneven spurts rather than in a smooth year-by-year progression. The vagaries of the business cycle will also have a major influence on year-to-year comparisons. Therefore, growth should not be judged on an annual basis, but, say, by taking units of several years each. Certain companies give promise of greater than normal growth not only for the next several-year period, but also for a considerable time beyond that. Those companies which decade by decade have consistently shown spectacular growth might be divided into two groups. For lack of better terms, I'll call one group those that happen to be both fortunate and able, and the other group those that are fortunate because they are able. A high order of management ability is a must for both groups. No company grows for a long period of years just because it's lucky. It must have and continue to keep a high order of business skill, otherwise it will not be able to capitalize on its good fortune and to defend its competitive position from the inroads of others. Point 2. Does the management have a determination to continue to develop products or processes that will still further increase total sales potentials when the growth potentials of currently attractive product lines have largely been exploited. Companies which have a significant growth prospect for the next few years because of new demand for existing lines, but which have neither policies nor plans to provide for further developments beyond this, may provide a vehicle for a nice one-time profit. They are not apt to provide the means for the consistent gains over 10 or 25 years that are the surest route to financial success. It is at this point that scientific research and development engineering begin to enter the picture. It is largely through these means that companies improve old products and develop new ones. This is the usual route by which a management not content with one isolated spurt of growth sees that growth occurs in a series of more or less continuous spurts. The investor usually obtains the best results in companies whose engineering or research is to a considerable extent devoted to products having some business relationship to those already within the scope of company activities. This does not mean that a desirable company may not have a number of divisions, some of which have product lines quite different from others. It does mean that a company with research centered around each of these divisions, like a cluster of trees, each growing additional branches from its own trunk, will usually do much better than a company working on a number of unrelated new products which, if successful, will land it in several new industries unrelated to its existing business. At first glance, point two may appear to be a mere repetition of point one. This is not the case. Point one is a matter of fact, appraising the degree of potential sales growth that now exists for a company's product. Point two is a matter of management attitude. 
does the company now recognize that in time it will almost certainly have grown up to the potential of its present market and that to continue to grow it may have to develop further new markets at some future time? It is the company that has both a good rating on the first point and an affirmative attitude on the second that is likely to be of the greatest investment interest. Point three. How effective are the company's research and development efforts in relation to its size? For a large number of publicly owned companies, it is not too difficult to get a figure showing the number of dollars being spent each year on research and development. Since virtually all such companies report their annual sales total, it's only a matter of the simplest mathematics to divide the research figure by total sales and so learn the percent of each sales dollar that a company is devoting to this type of activity. Many professional investment analysts like to compare this research figure for one company with that of others in the same general field. Sometimes they compare it with the average of the industry by averaging the figures of many somewhat similar companies. From this, Conclusions are drawn both as to the importance of a company's research effort in relation to competition and the amount of research per share of stock that the investor is getting in a particular company. Figures of this sort can prove a crude yardstick that may give a worthwhile hint that one company is doing an abnormal amount of research or another not nearly enough. But unless a great deal of further knowledge is obtained, such figures can be misleading. One reason for this is that companies vary enormously in what they include or exclude as research and development expense. One company will include a type of engineering expense that most authorities would not consider genuine research at all, since it's really tailoring an existing product to a particular order, in other words, sales engineering. Conversely, another company will charge the expense of operating a pilot plant on a completely new product to production rather than research. Most experts would call this a pure research function since it's directly related to obtaining the know-how to make a new product. If all companies were to report research on a comparable accounting basis, the relative figures on the amount of research done by various well-known companies might look quite different from those frequently used in financial circles. In no other major subdivision of business activity are to be found such great variations from one company to another between what goes in as expense and what comes out in benefits as occurs in research. Even among the best managed companies, this variation seems to run in a ratio of as much as two to one. By this is meant some well-run companies will get as much as twice the ultimate gain for each research dollar spent as will others. If averagely run companies are included, this variation between the best and the mediocre is still greater. This is largely because the big strides in the way of new products and processes are no longer the work of a single genius. They come from teams of highly trained men, each with a different specialty. One may be a chemist, another a solid-state physicist, a third a metallurgist, and a fourth a mathematician. The degree of skill of each of these experts is only part of what is needed to produce outstanding results. It's also necessary to have leaders who can coordinate the work of people of such diverse backgrounds and keep them driving toward a common goal. Consequently, the number or prestige of research workers in one company may be overshadowed by the effectiveness with which they are being helped to work as a team in another. Point four. Does the company have an above-average sales organization? In this competitive age, the products or services of few companies are so outstanding that they will sell to their maximum potentialities if they are not expertly merchandised. It is the making of a sale that is the most basic single activity of any business. Without sales, survival is impossible. It's the making of repeat sales to satisfied customers that is the first benchmark of success. 
Yet strange as it seems, the relative efficiency of a company's sales, advertising, and distributive organizations receives far less attention from most investors, even the careful ones, than do production, research, finance, or other major subdivisions of corporate activity. Of all the phases of a company's activity, none is easier to learn about from sources outside the company than the relative efficiency of a sales organization. Both competitors and customers know the answers. Equally important, they are seldom hesitant to express their views. The time spent by the careful investor in inquiring into this subject is usually richly rewarded. I am devoting less space to this matter of relative sales ability than I did to the matter of relative research ability. This does not mean that I consider it less important. In today's competitive world, many things are important to corporate success. However, outstanding production, sales, and research may be considered the three main columns upon which such success is based. Saying that one is more important than another is like saying that the heart, the lungs, or the digestive tract is the most important single organ for the proper functioning of the body. All are needed for survival and all must function well for vigorous health. Look around you at the companies that have proven outstanding investments. Try to find some that do not have both aggressive distribution and a constantly improving sales organization. Point 5. Does the company have a worthwhile profit margin? Here at last is a subject of importance which properly lends itself to the type of mathematical analysis which so many financial people feel is the backbone of sound investment decisions. From the standpoint of the investor, sales are only of value when and if they lead to increased profits. All the sales growth in the world won't produce the right type of investment vehicle if over the years profits don't grow correspondingly. The first step in examining profits is to study a company's profit margin, that is, to determine the number of cents of each dollar of sales that is brought down to operating profit. The wide variation between different companies, even those in the same industry, will immediately become apparent. Such a study should be made not for a single year, but for a series of years it then becomes evident that nearly all companies have broader profit margins as well as greater total dollar profits in years when an industry is unusually prosperous. However, it also becomes clear that the marginal companies, that is, those with the smaller profit margins, nearly always increase their profit margins by a considerably greater percentage in the good years than do the lower cost companies whose profit margins also get better, but not to so great a degree. This usually causes the weaker companies to show a greater percentage increase in earnings in a year of abnormally good business than do the stronger companies in the same field. However, it should also be remembered that these earnings will decline correspondingly more rapidly when the business tide turns. For this reason, I believe that the greatest long-range investment profits are never obtained by investing in marginal companies. The only reason for considering a long-range investment in a company with an abnormally low profit margin is that there might be strong indications that a fundamental change is taking place within the company. This would be such that the improvement in profit margins would be occurring for reasons other than a temporarily expanded volume of business. In other words, the company would not be marginal in the true sense of the word since the real reason for buying is that efficiency or new products developed within the company have taken it out of the marginal category. When such internal changes are taking place in a corporation which in other respects pretty well qualifies as the right type of long-range investment, it may be an unusually attractive purchase. So far as older and larger companies are concerned, most of the really big investment gains have come from companies having relatively broad profit margins. Usually, they have among the best such margins in their industry. In regard to young companies, and occasionally older ones, there is one important deviation from this rule, a deviation, however, that is generally more apparent than real. 
such companies will at times deliberately elect to speed up growth by spending all or a very large part of the profits they would otherwise have earned on even more research or on even more sales promotion than they would otherwise be doing. What is important in such instances is to make absolutely certain that it is actually still further research, still further sales promotion, or still more of any other activity which is being financed today so as to build for the future that is the real cause of the narrow or non-existent profit margin. The greatest care should be used to be sure that the volume of the activities being credited with reducing the profit margin is not merely the volume of these activities needed for a good rate of growth, but actually represents even more research, sales promotion, etc., than this. When this happens, the research company with an apparently poor profit margin may be an unusually attractive investment. However, with the exception of companies of this type in which the low profit margin is being deliberately engineered in order to further accelerate the growth rate, investors desiring maximum gains over the years had best stay away from low profit margin or marginal companies. Point 6. What is the company doing to maintain or improve profit margins? The success of a stock purchase does not depend on what is generally known about a company at the time the purchase is made. Rather, it depends upon what gets to be known about it after the stock has been bought. Therefore, it's not the profit margins of the past, but those of the future, that are basically important to the investor. In the age in which we live, there seems to be a constant threat to profit margins. Wages and salary costs go up year by year. Many companies now have long-range labor contracts calling for still further increases for several years ahead. Rising labor costs result in corresponding increases in raw materials and supplies. The trend of tax rates, particularly real estate and local tax rates, also seems to be steadily increasing. Against this background, different companies are going to have different results in the trend of their profit margins. Some companies are in the seemingly fortunate position that they can maintain profit margins simply by raising prices. This is usually because they are in industries in which the demand for their products is abnormally strong or because the selling prices of competitive products have gone up even more than their own. In our economy, however, maintaining or improving profit margins in this way usually proves a relatively temporary matter. This is because additional competitive production capacity is created. This new capacity sufficiently outbalances the increased gain so that, in time, cost increases can no longer be passed on as price increases. Profit margins then start to shrink. Some companies achieve great success by maintaining capital improvement or product engineering departments. The sole function of such departments is to design new equipment that will reduce costs and thus offset or partially offset the rising trend of wages. Many companies are constantly reviewing procedures and methods to see where economies can be brought about. The accounting function and the handling of records has been a particularly fertile field for this sort of activity. So has the transportation field. Shipping costs have risen more than most expenses because of the larger percentage of labor costs in most forms of transportation as compared to most types of manufacturing. Using new types of containers, heretofore unused methods of transportation, or even putting in branch plants to avoid cross-hauling have all cut costs for alert companies. None of these things can be brought about in a day. They all require close study, and considerable planning ahead. The prospective investor should give attention to the amount of ingenuity of the work being done on new ideas for cutting costs and improving profit margins. Here, the scuttlebutt method may prove of some value, but much less so than direct inquiry from company personnel. Fortunately, this is a field about which most top executives will talk in some detail. The companies which are doing the most successful work along this line are very likely to be the ones which have built up the organization with the know-how to continue to do constructive things in the future. 
they are extremely likely to be in the group offering the greatest long-range rewards to their shareholders. Point 7. Does the company have outstanding labor and personnel relations? Most investors may not fully appreciate the profits from good labor relations. Few of them fail to recognize the impact of bad labor relations. The effect on production of frequent and prolonged strikes is obvious to anyone making even the most cursory review of corporate financial statements. However, the difference in the degree of profitability between a company with good personnel relations and one with mediocre personnel relations is far greater than the direct cost of strikes. If workers feel that they are fairly treated by their employer, a background has been laid wherein efficient leadership can accomplish much in increasing productivity per worker. Furthermore, there is always considerable cost in training each new worker. Those companies with an abnormal labor turnover have therefore an element of unnecessary expense avoided by better managed enterprises. Companies with good labor relations usually are ones making every effort to settle grievances quickly. The small individual grievances that take long to settle and are not considered important by management are ones that smolder and finally flare up seriously. In addition to appraising the methods set up for settling grievances, the investor might also pay close attention to wage scales. The company that makes above-average profits while paying above-average wages for the area in which it is located is likely to have good labor relations. The investor who buys into a situation in which a significant part of earnings comes from paying below standard wages for the area involved may in time have serious trouble on his hands. Finally, the investor should be sensitive to the attitude of top management toward the rank-and-file employees. Underneath all the fine-sounding generalities, some managements have little feeling of responsibility for or interest in their ordinary workers. Their chief concern is that no greater share of their sales dollar go to lower echelon personnel than the pressure of militant unionism makes mandatory. Workers are readily hired or dismissed in large masses dependent on slight changes in the company's sales outlook or profit picture. No feeling of responsibility exists for the hardships this can cause to the families affected. Nothing is done to make ordinary employees feel they are wanted, needed, and part of the business picture. Nothing is done to build up the dignity of the individual worker. Managements with this attitude do not usually provide the background for the most desirable type of investment. Point 8. Does the company have outstanding executive relations? If having good relations with lower echelon personnel is important, creating the right atmosphere among executive personnel is vital. These are the men whose judgment, ingenuity, and teamwork will in time make or break any venture. Because the stakes for which they play are high, the tension on the job is frequently great. So is the chance that friction or resentment might create conditions whereby top executive talent either does not stay with the company or does not produce to its maximum ability if it does stay. The company offering greatest investment opportunities will be one in which there is a good executive climate. Executives will have confidence in their president and or board chairman. This means, among other things, that from the lowest levels on up, there is a feeling that promotions are based on ability, not factionalism. A ruling family is not promoted over the heads of the more able. Salary adjustments are reviewed regularly so that executives feel that merited increases will come without having to be demanded. Salaries are at least in line with the standard of the industry and the locality. Management will bring outsiders into anything other than starting jobs only if there is no possibility of finding anyone within the organization who can be promoted to fill the position. Top management will recognize that wherever human beings work together, some degree of factionalism and human friction will occur, but will not tolerate those who do not cooperate in team play so that such friction and factionalism is kept to an irreducible minimum. 
Much of this the investor can usually learn without too much direct questioning by chatting about the company with a few executives scattered at different levels of responsibility. The further a corporation departs from these standards, the less likely it is to be a really outstanding investment. Point nine: Does the company have depth to its management? A small corporation. Can do extremely well, and if other factors are right, provide a magnificent investment for a number of years under really able one-man management. However, all humans are finite, so even for smaller companies, the investor should have some idea of what can be done to prevent corporate disaster if the key man should no longer be available. Nowadays, this investment risk with an otherwise outstanding small company is not as great as it seems, in view of the recent tendency of big companies with plenty of management talent to buy up outstanding smaller units. However, companies worthy of investment interest are those that will continue to grow. Sooner or later, a company will reach a size where it just will not be able to take advantage of further opportunities unless it starts developing executive talent in some depth. This point will vary between companies depending on the industry in which they are engaged and the skill of the one-man management. It usually occurs when annual sales totals reach a point somewhere between fifteen and forty million dollars. Having the right executive climate, as discussed in point eight, becomes of major investment significance at this time. Another matter is worthy of the investor's attention in judging whether a company has suitable depth in management. Does top management welcome and evaluate suggestions from personnel, even if at times those suggestions carry with them adverse criticism of current management practices? So competitive is today's business world, and so great the need for improvement and change, that if pride or indifference prevent top management from exploring what has frequently been found to be a veritable gold mine of worthwhile ideas, the investment climate that results probably will not be the most suitable one for the investor. Neither is it likely to be one in which increasing numbers of vitally needed younger executives are going to develop. Point ten: How good are the company's cost analysis and accounting controls? No company is going to continue to have outstanding success for a long period of time if it cannot break down its overall costs with sufficient accuracy and detail to show the cost of each small step in its operation. Only in this way will a management know what most needs its attention. Only in this way can management judge whether it's properly solving each problem that does need its attention. Furthermore, most successful companies make not one but a vast series of products. If the management does not have a precise knowledge of the true cost of each product in relation to the others, it is under an extreme handicap. It becomes almost impossible to establish pricing policies that will ensure the maximum obtainable overall profit, consistent with discouraging undue competition. There is no way of knowing which products are worthy of special sales effort and promotion. Worst of all, some apparently successful activities may actually be operating at a loss, and unknown to management, may be decreasing rather than swelling the total of overall profits. Intelligent planning. Becomes almost impossible. In spite of the investment importance of accounting controls, it is usually only in instances of extreme inefficiency that the careful investor will get a clear picture of the status of cost accounting and related activities in a company in which he is contemplating investment. In this sphere, the scuttlebutt method will sometimes reveal companies that are really deficient. It will seldom tell much more than this. Direct inquiry of company personnel will usually elicit a completely sincere reply that the cost data are entirely adequate. Detailed cost sheets will often be shown in support of the statement. However, it is not so much the existence of detailed figures as their relative accuracy which is important. The best that the careful investor usually can do in this field is to recognize both the importance of the subject and his own limitations in making a worthwhile appraisal of it. 
Within these limits, he usually can only fall back on the general conclusion that a company well above average in most other aspects of business skill will probably be above average in this field too, as long as top management understands the basic importance of expert accounting controls and cost analysis. Point 11. Are there other aspects of the business, somewhat peculiar to the industry involved, which will give the investor important clues as to how outstanding the company may be in relation to its competition? By definition, this is somewhat of a catch-all point of inquiry. This is because matters of this sort are bound to differ considerably from each other. Those which are of great importance in some lines of business can, at times, be of little or no importance in others. For example, in most important operations involving retailing, the degree of skill a company has in handling real estate matters, the quality of its leases, for instance, is of great significance. In many other lines of business, a high degree of skill in this field is less important. Similarly, the relative skill with which a company handles its credits is of great significance to some companies, of minor or no importance to others. For both these matters, our old friend, the scuttlebutt method, will usually furnish the investor with a pretty clear picture. Frequently, his conclusions can be checked against mathematical ratios such as comparative leasing costs per dollar of sales or ratio of credit loss if the point is of sufficient importance to warrant careful study. In a number of lines of business, total insurance costs mount to an important percent of the sales dollar. At times, this can matter enough so that a company with, say, a 35% lower overall insurance cost than a competitor of the same size will have a broader margin of profit. In those industries where insurance is a big enough factor to affect earnings, a study of these ratios and a discussion of them with informed insurance people can be unusually rewarding to the investor. It gives a supplemental but indicative check as to how outstanding a particular management may be. This is because these lower insurance costs do not come solely from a greater skill in handling insurance in the same way, for example, as skill in handling real estate results in lower than average leasing costs. Rather, they are largely the reflection of overall skill in handling people, inventory, and fixed property so as to reduce the overall amount of accident, damage, and waste and thereby make these lower costs possible. An index of insurance costs in relation to the coverage obtained points out clearly which companies in a given field are well run. Patents are another matter having varying significance from company to company. For large companies, a strong patent position is usually a point of additional rather than basic strength. It usually blocks off certain subdivisions of the company's activities from the intense competition that might otherwise prevail. This normally enables these segments of the company's product lines to enjoy wider profit margins than would otherwise occur. This, in turn, tends to broaden the average of the entire line. Similarly, strong patent positions may at times give a company exclusive rights to the easiest or cheapest way of making a particular product. Competitors must go a longer way round to get to the same place, thereby giving the patent owner a tangible competitive advantage, although frequently a small one. Point 12. Does the company have a short-range or long-range outlook in regard to profits? Some companies will conduct their affairs so as to gain the greatest possible profit right now. Others will deliberately curtail maximum immediate profits to build up goodwill and thereby gain greater overall profits over a period of years. Treatment of customers and vendors gives frequent examples of this. One company will constantly make the sharpest possible deals with suppliers. Another will, at times, pay above contract price to a vendor who has had unexpected expense in making delivery because it wants to be sure of having a dependable source of needed raw materials or high-quality components available when the market has turned and supplies may be desperately needed. The difference in treatment of customers is equally noticeable. 
the company that will go to special trouble and expense to take care of the needs of a regular customer caught in an unexpected jam may show lower profits on the particular transaction, but far greater profits over the years. The scuttlebutt method usually reflects these differences in policies quite clearly. The investor wanting maximum results should favor companies with a truly long-range outlook concerning profits. Point 13. In the foreseeable future, will the growth of the company require sufficient equity financing so that the larger number of shares then outstanding will largely cancel the existing stockholders' benefit from this anticipated growth? The typical book on investment devotes so much space to a discussion on the corporation's cash position, corporate structure, percentage of capitalization in various classes of securities, etc., that it may well be asked why these purely financial aspects should not be given more than the amount of space devoted to this one point out of a total of 15. The reason is that it is the basic contention of this book that the intelligent investor should not buy common stocks simply because they are cheap, but only if they give promise of major gain to him. If investment is limited to outstanding situations, what really matters is whether the company's cash, plus further borrowing ability, is sufficient to take care of the capital needed to exploit the prospects of the next several years. If it is, and if the company is willing to borrow to the limit of prudence, the common stock investor need have no concern as to the more distant future. If the investor has properly appraised the situation, any equity financing that might be done some years ahead will be at prices so much higher than present levels that he need not be concerned. This is because the near-term financing will have produced enough increase in earnings by the time still further financing is needed some years hence to have brought the stock to a substantially higher price level. If this borrowing power is not now sufficient, however, equity financing becomes necessary. In this case, the attractiveness of the investment depends on careful calculations as to how much the dilution resulting from the greater number of shares to be outstanding will cut into the benefits to the present common stockholder that will result from the increased earnings this financing makes possible. Point 14. Does the management talk freely to investors about its affairs when things are going well but clam up when troubles and disappointments occur. It's the nature of business that in even the best-run companies, unexpected difficulties, profit squeezes, and unfavorable shifts in demand for their products will at times occur. Furthermore, the companies into which the investor should be buying, if the greatest gains are to occur, are companies which over the years will constantly, through the efforts of technical research, be trying to produce and sell new products and new processes. By the law of averages, some of these are bound to be costly failures. Others will have unexpected delays and heartbreaking expenses during the early period of plant shakedown. For months on end, such extra and unbudgeted costs will spoil the most carefully laid profit forecasts for the business as a whole. Such disappointments are an inevitable part of even the most successful business. If met forthrightly and with good judgment, they are merely one of the costs of eventual success. They are frequently a sign of strength rather than weakness in a company. How a management reacts to such matters can be a valuable clue to the investor. The management that does not report as freely when things are going badly as when they are going well usually clams up in this way for one of several rather significant reasons. It may not have a program worked out to solve the unanticipated difficulty. It may have become panicky. It may not have an adequate sense of responsibility to its stockholders, seeing no reason why it should report more than what may seem expedient at the moment. In any event, the investor will do well to exclude from investment any company that withholds or tries to hide bad news. Point 15. 
Does the company have a management of unquestionable integrity? The management of a company is always far closer to its assets than is the stockholder. Without breaking any laws, the number of ways in which those in control can benefit themselves and their families at the expense of the ordinary stockholder is almost infinite. One way is to put themselves, to say nothing of their relatives or in-laws, on the payroll at salaries far above the normal worth of the work performed. Another is to own properties they sell or rent to the corporation at above market rates. Among smaller corporations, this is sometimes hard to detect, since controlling families or key officers at times buy and lease real estate to such companies not for purposes of unfair gain, but in a sincere desire to free limited working capital for other corporate purposes. Another method for insiders to enrich themselves is to get the corporation's vendors to sell through certain brokerage firms which perform little if any service for the brokerage commissions involved but which are owned by these same insiders and relatives or friends. Probably most costly of all to the investor is the abuse by insiders of their power of issuing common stock options. They can pervert this legitimate method of compensating able management by issuing to themselves amounts of stock far beyond what an unbiased outsider might judge to represent a fair reward for services performed. There is only one real protection against abuses like these. This is to confine investments to companies the managements of which have a highly developed sense of trusteeship and moral responsibility to their stockholders. This is a point concerning which the scuttlebutt method can be very helpful. Any investment may still be considered interesting if it falls down in regard to almost any other one of the fifteen points which have now been covered, but rates an unusually high score in regard to all the rest. Regardless of how high the rating may be in all other matters, however, if there is a serious question of the lack of a strong management sense of trusteeship for stockholders, the investor should never seriously consider participating in such an enterprise. Chapter 4. What to Buy Applying This to Your Own Needs The average investor is not a specialist in the field of investment. If a man, he usually gives but a tiny fraction of the time or mental effort to handling his investments that he devotes to his own work. If a woman, the time and effort given to investments is equally small compared to that devoted to her normal duties. The result is that the typical investor has usually gathered a good deal of the half-truths, misconceptions, and just plain bunk that the general public has gradually accumulated about successful investing. One of the most widespread and least accurate of such ideas is the popular conception of what traits are needed to be an investment wizard. If a public opinion poll were taken on this subject... I suspect John Q. Public's composite picture of such an expert would be an introverted, bookish individual with an accounting-type mind. This scholastic-like investment expert would sit all day in undisturbed isolation, poring over vast quantities of balance sheets, corporate earning statements, and trade statistics. From these... His superior intellect and deep understanding of figures would glean information not available to the ordinary mortal. This type of cloistered study would yield invaluable knowledge about the location of magnificent investments. Like so many other widespread misconceptions, this mental picture has just enough accuracy to make it highly dangerous for anyone wanting to get the greatest long-range benefit from common stocks. As already pointed out in the discussion of the 15 points to be considered, if a major investment winner is to be selected by any means other than pure luck, a few of these matters are largely determined by cloistered mathematical calculation. Furthermore, as mentioned near the beginning of this book, there is more than one method by which an investor, if sufficiently skilled, can over the years make some money occasionally even really worthwhile money, through investment. The purpose of this book 
is not to point out every way such money can be made. Rather, it's to point out the best way. By the best way is meant the greatest total profit for the least risk. The type of accounting, statistical activity which the general public seems to visualize as the heart of successful investing will, if enough effort be given it, turn up some apparent bargains. Some of these may be real bargains. In the case of others, there may be such acute business troubles lying ahead, yet not discernible from a purely statistical study, that instead of being bargains, they are actually selling at prices which in a few years would have proven to be very high. Meanwhile, in the case of even the genuine bargain, the degree by which it is undervalued is usually somewhat limited. The time it takes to get adjusted to its true value is frequently considerable. So far as I have been able to observe, this means that over a time sufficient to give a fair comparison, say five years, the most skilled statistical bargain hunter ends up with a profit which is but a small part of the profit attained by those using reasonable intelligence in appraising the business characteristics of superbly managed growth companies. This, of course, is after charging the growth stock investor with losses on ventures which did not turn out as expected and charging the bargain hunter for a proportionate amount of bargains that just didn't turn out. The reason why the growth stocks do so much better is that they seem to show gains in value in the hundreds of percent each decade. In contrast, it's an unusual bargain that is as much as 50% undervalued. The cumulative effect of this simple arithmetic should be obvious. At this point, the potential investor may have to start revising his ideas about the amount of time needed to locate the right investments for his purpose, to say nothing of the characteristics he must have if he is to find them. Perhaps he looked forward to spending a few hours each week in the comfort of his home, studying scads of written material which he felt would unlock the door to worthwhile profits. He just does not have the time to seek out, cultivate, and talk with all the various people it might be wise to contact if he wants to handle his common stock investments to his optimum benefit. Perhaps he does have the time. He still may not have the inclination and personality to seek out and chat with a group of people, most of whom he previously had not known very well, if at all. Furthermore, it's not enough just to chat with them. It's necessary to arouse their interest and their confidence to a point where they will tell what they know. The successful investor is usually an individual who is inherently interested in business problems. This results in his discussing such matters in a way that will arouse the interest of those from whom he is seeking data. Naturally, he must have reasonably good judgment or all the data he gets will avail him nothing. Assuming an investor desires the type of huge, long-range gain which I believe should be the objective of nearly all common stock purchases, there is one matter which he must decide for himself whether he uses an investment advisor or handles his own affairs. It's a decision which must be made because the type of stocks which qualify most satisfactorily under the previously discussed 15 points can vary considerably among themselves in their investment characteristics. At one end of the scale are large companies which, in spite of outstanding prospects of major further growth, are so financially strong, with roots going so deep into the economic soil, that they qualify under the general classification of institutional stocks. This means that insurance companies, professional trustees, and similar institutional buyers will buy them. They will do so because they feel that while they may misjudge market prices and could lose a part of their original investment should they be forced to sell such stocks at a time of lower quotations, they are avoiding the greater danger of loss they could suffer if they bought into a company that subsequently fell from its present competitive position. At the other end of the scale also of extreme interest for the right sort of long-range investment, are small and frequently young companies which may only have total sales of from one to six or seven million dollars per annum, but which also have products that might bring a sensational future. 
To qualify under the 15 points already described, such companies will usually have a combination of outstanding business management and equally capable scientific personnel who are pioneering in a new or economically promising field. The young growth stock offers by far the greatest possibility of gain. Sometimes this can mount up to several thousand percent in a decade. But making at least an occasional investment mistake is inevitable even for the most skilled investor. It should never be forgotten that if such a mistake is made in this type of common stock, every dollar put into the investment can be lost. In contrast, if the stock is bought according to the rules described in the next chapter, any losses that might occur in the older and more established growth stocks should be temporary, resulting from a period of unanticipated decline in the stock market as a whole. The long-range gain in value of this class of big company growth stock will, over the years, be considerably less than that of the small and usually younger enterprise. Nevertheless, it will mount to thoroughly worthwhile totals. Even in the most conservative of the growth stocks, it should run to at least several times the original investment. In all these cases, however, the gain in value over the years of the more conservative group of stocks should be enough to outweigh even complete loss of all funds put into the more risky type. Meanwhile, if properly selected, the more risky type could significantly increase the total capital gain. Equally important if this happens, these young risky companies will by that time have reached a point in their own development where their stocks will no longer be carrying anything like the former degree of risk, but may even have progressed to a status where institutions have begun buying them. The problems of the small investor are somewhat more difficult. The large investor can often completely ignore the matter of dividend returns in his endeavor to employ all his funds in situations affording maximum growth potential. After his funds are so invested, he may still obtain from them sufficient dividends either to take care of his desired standard of living or to enable him to attain this standard if the dividend income is added to his other regular earning power. Most small investors cannot live on the return on their investment no matter how high a yield is obtained, since the total value of their holdings is not great enough. Therefore, for the small investor, the matter of current dividend return usually comes down to a choice between a few hundred dollars a year starting right now, or the chance of obtaining an income many times this few hundred dollars a year at a later date. Before reaching a decision on this crucial point, there is one matter which the small investor should face squarely. This is that the only funds he should consider using for common stock investment are funds that are truly surplus. This doesn't mean using all funds that remain over and above what he needs for everyday living expense. Except in the most unusual circumstances, he should have a backlog of several thousand dollars sufficient to take care of illnesses or other unexpected contingencies before attempting to buy anything with as much intrinsic risk as a common stock. Similarly, funds already set aside for some specific future purpose, such as sending a child through college, should never be risked in the stock market. It's only after taking care of matters of this sort that he should consider common stock investment. Chapter 5. When to Buy The preceding chapters attempted to show that the heart of successful investing is knowing how to find the minority of stocks that in the years ahead will have spectacular growth in their per-share earnings. Therefore, is there any reason to divert time or mental effort from the main issue? Does not the matter of when to buy become of relatively minor importance? Once the investor is sure he has definitely found an outstanding stock, isn't any time at all a good time to buy it? The answer to this depends somewhat on the investor's objective. It also depends on his temperament. Let's take an example. With the ease of hindsight, it can be made the most extreme example in modern financial history. 
This would be the purchase of several superbly selected enterprises in the summer of 1929, or just before the greatest stock market crash of American history. In time, such a purchase would have turned out well. But twenty-five years later, it would provide a much smaller percentage gain than would have been the case if, having done the hardest part of the job in selecting his companies properly, an investor had made the small extra effort needed to understand a few simple principles about the timing of growth stocks. In other words, if the right stocks are bought and held long enough, they will always produce some profit. Usually, they will produce a handsome profit. However, to produce close to the maximum profit, the kind of spectacular profit defined earlier, some consideration must be given to timing. The conventional method of timing when to buy stocks is, I believe, just as silly as it appears on the surface to be sensible. This method is to marshal a vast mass of economic data. From these data, conclusions are reached as to the near and medium-term course of general business. More sophisticated investors will usually form opinions about the future course of money rates as well as business activity. Then, if their forecasts for all these matters indicate no major worsening of background conditions, the conclusion is that the desired stock may be bought. It sometimes appears that dark clouds are forming on the horizon. Then, those who use this generally accepted method will postpone or cancel purchases they otherwise would make. Let's review for a moment some of the basic characteristics of outstandingly desirable investments, as discussed in the preceding chapter. These companies are usually working in one way or another on the very frontiers of scientific technology. They're developing various new products or processes from the laboratory through the pilot plant to the early stages of commercial production. All of this costs money in varying amounts. All of it is a drain on other profits of the business. Even in the early stage of commercial production, the extra sales expense involved in building sufficient volume for a new product to furnish the desired margin of profit. Is such that the out-of-pocket losses at this stage of development may be greater than they were during the pilot plant period. From the standpoint of the investor, there are two aspects of all this that have particular significance. One of these is the impossibility of depending on any sure timetable in the development cycle of a new product. The other is that even for the most brilliantly managed enterprises, a percentage of failures is part of the cost of doing business. In a sport such as baseball, even the most outstanding league champions will have dropped some percentage of their scheduled games. The point in the development of a new process that is perhaps worth the closest scrutiny from the standpoint of timing the buying of common stocks. Is that at which the first full-scale commercial plant is about to begin production? In a new plant for even established processes or products, there will probably be a shakedown period of six to eight weeks that will prove rather expensive. It takes this long to get the equipment adjusted to the required operating efficiency and to weed out the inevitable bugs that seem to occur in breaking in modern intricate machinery. When the process is really revolutionary, this expensive shakedown period may extend far beyond the estimate of even the most pessimistic company engineer. Furthermore, when problems finally do get solved. The weary stockholder still cannot look forward to immediate profits. There are more months of still further drain, while even more of the company's profits from older lines are being plowed back into special sales and advertising efforts to get the new product accepted. It may be that the company making all this effort. Is having such growth in revenue from other and older products that the drain on profits is not noticed by the average stockholder. Frequently, however, just the opposite happens. 
As word first gets out about a spectacular new product in the laboratory of a well-run company, eager buyers bid up the price of that company's shares. When word comes of successful pilot plant operation, the shares go still higher. Few think of the old analogy that operating a pilot plant is like driving an automobile over a winding country road at ten miles per hour. Running a commercial plant is like driving on that same road at one hundred miles per hour. Then, when month after month difficulties crop up in getting the commercial plant started, these unexpected expenses cause per share earnings to dip noticeably. Word spreads that the plant is in trouble. Nobody can guarantee when, if ever, the problems will be solved. The former eager buyers of the stock. Become discouraged sellers. Down goes the price of the stock. The longer the shakedown lasts, the more market quotations sag. At last comes the good news that the plant is finally running smoothly. A two-day rally occurs in the price of the stock. However, in the following quarter, when special sales expenses have caused a still further sag in net income, the stock falls to the lowest price in years. Word passes all through the financial community that the management has blundered. At this point, the stock might well prove a sensational buy. Once the extra sales effort has produced enough volume to make the first production scale plant pay, normal sales effort is frequently enough to continue the upward movement of the sales curve for many years. Since the same techniques are used, the placing in operation of a second, third, fourth, and fifth plant can nearly always be done without the delays and special expenses that occurred during the prolonged shakedown period of the first plant. By the time plant number five is running at capacity, the company has grown so big and prosperous that the whole cycle can be repeated on another brand new product without the same drain on earnings percentage-wise or the same downward effect on the price of the company's shares. The investor has acquired at the right time an investment which can grow for him for many years. What is the common denominator of the examples given? It's that a worthwhile improvement in earnings is coming in the right sort of company, but that this particular increase in earnings has not yet produced an upward move in the price of that company's shares. I believe that whenever this situation occurs, the right sort of investment may be considered to be in a buying range. Conversely, when it does not occur, an investor will still, in the long run, make money if he buys into outstanding companies. However, he had then better have a somewhat greater degree of patience, for it'll take him longer to make this money, and percentage-wise, it will be a considerably smaller profit on his original investment. Does this mean that if a person has some money to invest, he should completely ignore what the future trend of the business cycle may be and invest 100% of this fund the moment he has found the right stocks, as defined in Chapter Three, and located a good buying point, as indicated in this chapter? A depression might strike right after he has made his investment. Since a decline of forty to fifty percent from its peak is not at all uncommon for even the best stock in a normal business depression, is not completely ignoring the business cycle rather a risky policy. I think this risk may be taken in stride by the investor who, for a considerable period of time, has already had the bulk of his stocks placed in well-chosen situations, if properly chosen. These should by now have already shown him some fairly substantial capital gains, but now, either because he believes one of his securities should be sold, or because some new funds have come his way, such an investor has funds to purchase something new. Unless it's one of those rare years when speculative buying is running riot in the stock market and major economic storm signals are virtually screaming their warnings. As happened in 1928 and 1929, I believe this class of investor should ignore any guesses on the coming trend of general business or the stock market. Instead, 
he should invest the appropriate funds as soon as the suitable buying opportunity arises. In contrast to guessing which way general business or the stock market may go, he should be able to judge with only a small probability of error what the company into which he wants to buy is going to do in relation to business in general. Therefore, he starts off with two advantages. He's making his bet upon something which he knows to be the case rather than upon something about which he is largely guessing. Furthermore, since by definition he's only buying into a situation which, for one reason or another, is about to have a worthwhile increase in its earning power in the near or medium term future, he has a second element of support. Just as his stock would have risen more than the average stock when this new source of earning power became recognized in the marketplace if business had remained good, so if by bad fortune he has made his new purchase just prior to a general market break, this same new source of earnings should prevent these shares from declining quite as much as other stocks of the same general type. However, many investors are not in the happy position of having a backlog of well-chosen investments bought comfortably below present prices. Perhaps this may be the first time they have funds to invest. Perhaps they may have a portfolio of bonds or relatively static non-growth stocks which at long last they desire to convert into shares that in the future will show them more worthwhile gains. If such investors get possession of new funds or develop a desire to convert to growth stocks after a prolonged period of prosperity and many years of rising stock prices, should they, too, ignore the hazards of a possible business depression? Such an investor would not be in a very happy position if, later on, he realized he had committed all or most of his assets near the top of a long rise or just prior to a major decline. This does create a problem. However, the solution to this problem is not especially difficult. As in so many other things connected with the stock market, it just requires an extra bit of patience. I believe investors in this group should start buying the appropriate type of common stocks just as soon as they feel sure they have located one or more of them. However, having made a start in this type of purchasing, they should stagger the timing of further buying. They should plan to allow several years before the final part of their available funds will have become invested. By so doing, if the market has a severe decline somewhere in this period, they will still have purchasing power available to take advantage of such a decline. If no decline occurs and they have properly selected their earlier purchases, they should have at least a few substantial gains on such holdings. This would provide a cushion so that if a severe decline happened to occur at the worst possible time for them, which would be just after the final part of their funds had become fully invested, the gains on the earlier purchases should largely, if not entirely, offset the declines on the more recent ones. No severe loss of original capital would therefore be involved. There is an equally important reason why investors who have not already obtained a record of satisfactory investments and who have enough funds to be able to stagger their purchases should do so. This is that such investors will have had a practical demonstration prior to using up all their funds that they or their advisors are sufficient masters of investment technique to operate with reasonable efficiency. In the event that such a record had not been attained, at least all of an investor's assets would not be committed before he had had a warning signal to revise his investment technique or to get someone else to handle such matters for him. All types of common stock investors might well keep one basic thought in mind. Otherwise, the financial community's constant worry about and preoccupation with the danger of downswings in the business cycle will paralyze much worthwhile investment action. This thought is that the current phase of the business cycle is but one of at least five powerful forces. 
All of these forces, either by influencing mass psychology or by direct economic operation, can have an extremely powerful influence on the general level of stock prices. The other four influences are the trend of interest rates, the overall governmental attitude toward investment and private enterprise, the long-range trend to more and more inflation, and, possibly most powerful of all, new inventions and techniques as they affect old industries. These forces are seldom all pulling stock prices in the same direction at the same time, nor is any one of them necessarily going to be of vastly greater importance than any other for long periods of time. So complex and diverse are these influences that the safest course to follow will be the one that at first glance appears to be the most risky. This is to take investment action when matters you know about a specific company appear to warrant such action. Be undeterred by fears or hopes based on conjectures or conclusions based on surmises. Chapter 6 when to sell, and when not to. There are many good reasons why an investor might decide to sell common stocks. He may want to build a new home or finance his son in a business. Any one of a number of similar reasons can, from the standpoint of happy living, make selling common stocks sensible. This type of selling, however, is personal rather than financial in its motive. As such, it is well beyond the scope of this book. These comments are only designed to cover that type of selling that is motivated by a single objective, obtaining the greatest total dollar benefit from the investment dollars available. I believe there are three reasons, and three reasons only, for the sale of any common stock which has been originally selected according to the investment principles already discussed. The first of these reasons should be obvious to anyone. This is when a mistake has been made in the original purchase, and it becomes increasingly clear that the factual background of the particular company is, by a significant margin, less favorable than originally believed. The proper handling of this type of situation is largely a matter of emotional self-control. To some degree, it also depends upon the investor's ability to be honest with himself. Two of the important characteristics of common stock investment are the large profits that can come with proper handling, and the high degree of skill, knowledge, and judgment required for such proper handling. Since the process of obtaining these almost fantastic profits is so complex, it is not surprising that a certain percentage of errors in purchasing are sure to occur. Fortunately, the long-range profits from really good common stocks should more than balance the losses from a normal percentage of such mistakes. They should leave a tremendous margin of gain as well. This is particularly true if the mistake is recognized quickly. When this happens, losses, if any, should be far smaller than if the stock bought in error had been held for a long period of time. Even more important, the funds tied up in the undesirable situation are freed to be used for something else which, if properly selected, should produce substantial gains. However, there is a complicating factor that makes the handling of investment mistakes more difficult. This is the ego in each of us. None of us likes to admit to himself that he's been wrong. If we've made a mistake in buying a stock, but can sell the stock at a small profit, we have somehow lost any sense of having been foolish. On the other hand, if we sell at a small loss, we are quite unhappy about the whole matter. This reaction, while completely natural and normal, is probably one of the most dangerous in which we can indulge ourselves in the entire investment process. More money has probably been lost by investors holding a stock they really did not want until they could at least come out even than from any other single reason. If to these actual losses are added, the profits that might have been made through the proper reinvestment of these funds, if such reinvestment had been made when the mistake was first realized, the cost of self-indulgence becomes truly tremendous. 
Furthermore, this dislike of taking a loss, even a small loss, is just as illogical as it is natural. If the real object of common stock investment is the making of a gain of a great many hundreds percent over a period of years, the difference between, say, a 20% loss or a 5% profit becomes a comparatively insignificant matter. What matters is not whether a loss occasionally occurs. What does matter is whether worthwhile profits so often fail to materialize that the skill of the investor or his advisor in handling investments must be questioned. While losses should never cause strong self-disgust or emotional upset, neither should they be passed over lightly. They should always be reviewed with care so that a lesson is learned from each of them. If the particular elements which caused a misjudgment on a common stock purchase are thoroughly understood, it's unlikely that another poor purchase will be made through misjudging the same investment factors. We come now to the second reason why sales should be made of a common stock purchased under the investment principles already outlined in Chapters 2 and 3. Sales should always be made of the stock of a company which, because of changes resulting from the passage of time, no longer qualifies in regard to the 15 points outlined in Chapter 3 to about the same degree it qualified at the time of purchase. This is why investors should be constantly on their guard. It explains why it's of such importance to keep at all times in close contact with the affairs of companies whose shares are held. When companies deteriorate in this way, they usually do so for one of two reasons. Either there's been a deterioration of management, or the company no longer has the prospect of increasing the markets for its product in the way it formerly did. Sometimes, management deteriorates because success has affected one or more key executives. Smugness, complacency, or inertia replace the former drive and ingenuity. More often, it occurs because a new set of top executives do not measure up to the standard of performance set by their predecessors. Either they no longer hold to the policies that have made the company outstandingly successful, or they do not have the ability to continue to carry out such policies. When any of these things happen, the affected stock should be sold at once, regardless of how good the general market may look or how big the capital gains tax may be. Similarly, it sometimes happens that after growing spectacularly for many years, a company will reach a stage where the growth prospects of its markets are exhausted. From this time on, it will only do about as well as industry as a whole. It will only progress at about the same rate as the national economy does. This change may not be due to any deterioration of the management. Many managements show great skill in developing related or allied products to take advantage of growth in their immediate field. They recognize, however, that they do not have any particular advantage if they go into unrelated spheres of activity. Hence, if after years of being experts in a young and growing industry, times change and the company has pretty well exhausted the growth prospects of its market, its shares have deteriorated in an important way from the standards outlined under our frequently mentioned 15 points. Such a stock should then be sold. In this instance, selling might take place at a more leisurely pace than if management deterioration had set in. Possibly, part of the holding might be kept until a more suitable investment could be found. However, in any event, the company should be recognized as no longer suitable for worthwhile investment. The amount of capital gains tax, no matter how large, should seldom prevent the switching of such funds into some other situation which in the years ahead may grow in a manner similar to the way in which this investment formerly grew. There's a good test as to whether companies no longer adequately qualify in regard to this matter of expected further growth. This is for the investor to ask himself whether, at the next peak of a business cycle, regardless of what may happen in the meantime, the comparative per-share earnings, after allowances for stock dividends and stock splits, but not for new shares issued for additional capital, will probably show at least as great an increase from present levels as the present levels show from the last known peak of general business activity. 
If the answer is in the affirmative, the stock probably should be held. If in the negative, it should probably be sold. For those who follow the right principles in making their original purchases, the third reason why a stock might be sold seldom arises and should be acted upon only if an investor is very sure of his ground. It arises from the fact that opportunities for attractive investment are extremely hard to find. From a timing standpoint, they are seldom found just when investment funds happen to be available. If an investor has had funds for investment for quite a period of time and found few attractive situations into which to place these funds, he may well place some or all of them in a well run company which he believes has definite growth prospects. However, these growth prospects may be at a slower average annual rate than may appear to be the case for some other seemingly more attractive situation that is found later. The already owned company may, in some other important aspects, appear to be less attractive as well. If the evidence is clear cut, and the investor feels quite sure of his ground, it will, even after paying capital gains taxes, probably pay him handsomely to switch into the situation with seemingly better prospects. The company that can show an average annual increase of 12% for a long period of years should be a source of considerable financial satisfaction to its owners. However, the difference between these results and those that could occur from a company showing a 20% average annual gain would be well worth the additional trouble and capital gains taxes that might be involved. A word of caution may not be amiss, however, in regard to too readily selling a common stock in the hope of switching these funds into a still better one. There's always the risk that some major element in the picture has been misjudged. If this happens, the investment probably will not turn out nearly as well as anticipated. In contrast, an alert investor who has held a good stock for some time usually gets to know its less desirable as well as its more desirable characteristics. Therefore, before selling a rather satisfactory holding in order to get a still better one, there is need of the greatest care in trying to appraise accurately all elements of the situation. At this point, the critical reader has probably discerned a basic investment principle which, by and large, seems only to be understood by a small minority of successful investors. This is that once a stock has been properly selected and has borne the test of time, it is only occasionally that there is any reason for selling it at all. However, recommendations and comments continue to pour out of the financial community, giving other types of reasons for selling outstanding common stocks. What about the validity of such reasons? Most frequently given of such reasons is the conviction that a general stock market decline of some proportion is somewhere in the offing. In the preceding chapter, I tried to show that postponing an attractive purchase because of fear of what the general market might do will, over the years, prove very costly. This is because the investor is ignoring a powerful influence about which he has positive knowledge through fear of a less powerful force about which, in the present state of human knowledge, he and everyone else is largely guessing. If the argument is valid that the purchase of attractive common stocks should not be unduly influenced by fear of ordinary bear markets, the argument against selling outstanding stocks because of these fears is even more impressive. All the arguments mentioned in the previous chapter equally apply here. Furthermore, the chance of the investor being right in making such sales is still further diminished by the factor of the capital gains tax. Because of the very large profits such outstanding stocks should be showing if they've been held for a period of years, this capital gains tax can still further accentuate the cost of making such sales. There's another and even more costly reason why an investor should never sell out of an outstanding situation because of the possibility that an ordinary bear market may be about to occur. If the company is really a right one, the next bull market should see the stock making a new peak well above those so far attained. How is the investor to know when to buy back? 
Theoretically, it should be after the coming decline. However, this presupposes that the investor will know when the decline will end. I've seen many investors dispose of a holding that was to show stupendous gain in the years ahead because of this fear of a coming bear market. Frequently, the bear market never came, and the stock went right on up. When a bear market has come, I have not seen one time in ten when the investor actually got back into the same shares before they had gone up above his selling price. Usually, he either waited for them to go far lower than they actually dropped, or when they were way down, fear of something else happening still prevented their reinstatement. This brings us to another line of reasoning, so often used to cause well-intentioned but unsophisticated investors to miss huge future profits. This is the argument that an outstanding stock has become overpriced and therefore should be sold. What is more logical than this? If a stock is overpriced, why not sell it rather than keep it? Before reaching hasty conclusions, let's look a little bit below the surface. Just what is overpriced? What are we trying to accomplish? Any really good stock will sell and should sell at a higher ratio to current earnings than a stock with a stable rather than an expanding earning power. After all, this probability of participating in continued growth is obviously worth something. When we say that the stock is overpriced, we may mean that it's selling at an even higher ratio in relation to this expected earning power than we believe it should be. Possibly, we may mean that it's selling at an even higher ratio than our other comparable stocks with similar prospects of materially increasing their future earnings. All of this is trying to measure something with a greater degree of preciseness than is possible. The investor cannot pinpoint just how much per share a particular company will earn two years from now. He can at best judge this within such general and non-mathematical limits as about the same, up moderately, up a lot, or up tremendously. As a matter of fact, the company's top management cannot come a great deal closer than this. Either they or the investor should come pretty close in judging whether a sizable increase in average earnings is likely to occur a few years from now. But just how much increase or the exact year in which it will occur usually involves guessing on enough variables to make precise predictions impossible. Under these circumstances, how can anyone say with even moderate precision just what is overpriced for an outstanding company with an unusually rapid growth rate? Suppose that instead of selling at twenty-five times earnings as usually happens, the stock is now at thirty-five times earnings. Perhaps there are new products in the immediate future, the real economic importance of which the financial community has not yet grasped. Perhaps there are not any such products. If the growth rate is so good that in another ten years the company might well have quadrupled, is it really of such great concern whether at the moment the stock might or might not be thirty-five percent overpriced? That which really matters is not to disturb a position that is going to be worth a great deal more later. Again. Our old friend, the capital gains tax, adds its bit to these conclusions. Growth stocks, which are recommended for sale because they are supposedly overpriced, nearly always will cost their owners a sizable capital gains tax if they're sold. Therefore, in addition to the risk of losing a permanent position in a company which, over the years, should continue to show unusual further gains, we also incur a sizable tax liability. Isn't it safer and cheaper simply to make up our minds that momentarily the stock may be somewhat ahead of itself? We already have a sizable profit in it. If for a while the stock loses, say, thirty-five percent of its current market quotation, is this really such a serious matter? Again, isn't the maintaining of our position rather than the possibility of temporarily losing a small part of our capital gain? The matter which is really important. There is still one other argument investors sometimes use to separate themselves from the profits they would otherwise make. This one is the most ridiculous of all. It's that the stock they own has had a huge advance. 
Therefore, just because it has gone up, it has probably used up most of its potential. Consequently, they should sell it and buy something that hasn't gone up yet. Outstanding companies, the only type which I believe the investor should buy, just don't function this way. How they do function might best be understood by considering the following somewhat fanciful analogy. Suppose it's the day you were graduated from college. If you didn't go to college, consider it to be the day of your high school graduation. From the standpoint of our example, it will make no difference whatsoever. Now, suppose that on this day, each of your male classmates had an urgent need of immediate cash. Each offered you the same deal. If you would give them a sum of money equivalent to ten times whatever they might earn during the first twelve months after they had gone to work, that classmate would, for the balance of his life, turn over to you one quarter of each year's earnings. Finally, let us suppose that while you thought this was an excellent proposition, you only had spare cash on hand sufficient to make such a deal with three of your classmates. At this point, your reasoning would closely resemble that of the investor using sound investment principles in selecting common stocks. You would immediately start analyzing your classmates, not from the standpoint of how pleasant they might be or even how talented they might be in other ways, but solely to determine how much money they might make. If you were part of a large class, you would probably eliminate quite a number solely on the ground of not knowing them sufficiently well to be able to pass worthwhile judgment on just how financially proficient they actually would get to be. Here again, the analogy with intelligent common stock buying runs very close. Eventually, you would pick the three classmates you felt would have the greatest future earning power. You would make your deal with them. Ten years have passed. One of your three has done sensationally. Going to work for a large corporation, he has won promotion after promotion. Already, insiders in the company are saying that the president has his eye on him and that in another ten years he will probably take the top job. He will be in line for the large compensation, stock options, and pension benefits that go with that job. Under these circumstances, what would even the writers of stock market reports who urge taking profits on superb stocks that have gotten ahead of the market think of your selling out your contract with this former classmate, just because someone has offered you 600% on your original investment? You would think that anyone would need to have his head examined if he were to advise you to sell this contract and replace it with one with another former classmate whose annual earnings still were about the same as when he left school ten years before. The argument that your successful classmate had had his advance, while the advance of your financially unsuccessful classmate still lay ahead of him, would probably sound rather silly. If you know your common stocks equally well, many of the arguments commonly heard for selling the good one sound equally silly. You may be thinking all this sounds fine, but actually classmates are not common stocks. To be sure, there is one major difference. That difference increases rather than decreases the reason for never selling the outstanding common stock just because it has had a huge rise and may be temporarily overpriced. This difference is that the classmate is finite, may die soon, and is sure to die eventually. There is no similar lifespan for the common stock. The company behind the common stock can have a practice of selecting management talent in depth and training such talent in company policies, methods, and techniques in a way which will retain and pass on the corporate vigor for generations. Look at DuPont in its second century of corporate existence. Look at Dow years after the death of its brilliant founder. In this era of unlimited human wants and incredible markets, there is no limitation to corporate growth such as the lifespan places upon the individual. Perhaps the thoughts behind this chapter might be put into a single sentence. If the job has been correctly done when a common stock is purchased, the time to sell it is almost never. 
Chapter 7 The Hullabaloo About Dividends There is a considerable degree of twisted thinking and general acceptance of half-truths about a number of aspects of common stock investments. However, whenever the significance and importance of dividends are considered, the confusion of the typical investor becomes little short of monumental. This confusion and acceptance of half-truths spreads over even to the choice of words customarily used in describing various types of dividend action. A corporation has been paying no dividend or a small one. Its president requests the board of directors to start paying a substantial dividend. This is done. In speaking of this action, he or the board will often describe it by saying that the time had come to do something for stockholders. The inference is that by not paying or raising the dividend, the company had been doing nothing for its stockholders. This could possibly be true. However, it certainly was not true just because no dividend action had been taken. It's possible that by spending earnings not as dividends but to build a new plant, to launch a new product line, or to install some major cost-saving equipment in an old plant, the management might have been doing much more to benefit the stockholder than it would have been doing just by passing these earnings out as dividends. No matter what might be done with any earnings not passed on as dividends, increases in the dividend rate are invariably referred to as favorable dividend action. Possibly, with greater reason, reduction or elimination of dividends is nearly always called unfavorable. One of the main reasons for the confusion about dividends in the public mind is the great variation between the amount of benefit, if any, that accrues to the stockholder each time earnings are not passed on to him but retained in the business. At times, he's not benefited at all by such retained earnings. At others, he's benefited only in a negative sense. If the earnings were not retained, his holdings would decrease in value. However, the retained earnings in no sense increase the value of his holdings, therefore they seem of no benefit to him. Finally, in the many cases where the stockholder benefits enormously from retained earnings, the benefits accrue in quite different proportions to different types of stockholders within the same company, thereby confusing investor thinking even more. In other words, each time earnings are not passed out as dividends, such action must be examined on its own merit to see exactly what is actually happening. It might pay to look a little below the surface here, and discuss some of these differences in detail. When do stockholders get no benefit from retained earnings? One way is when managements pile up cash and liquid assets far beyond any present or prospective needs of the business. The management might have no nefarious motive in doing this. Some executives get a sense of confidence and security from steadily piling up unneeded liquid reserves. They don't seem to realize they are buttressing their own feelings of security by not turning over to the stockholder wealth which he should be entitled to use in his own way and as he sees fit. Today, there are tax laws which tend to curb this evil so that, while it still occurs, it's no longer the factor which it once was. There's another and more serious way in which earnings are frequently retained in the business without any significant benefit to stockholders. This occurs when substandard managements can get only a subnormal return on the capital already in the business, yet use the retained earnings merely to enlarge the inefficient operation rather than to make it better. What normally happens is that the management, having in time built up a larger inefficient domain over which to rule, usually succeeds in justifying bigger salaries for itself on the grounds that it's doing a bigger job. The stockholders end up with little or no profit. Neither of these situations is likely to affect the investor who follows the concept discussed in this book. He's buying stocks because they are outstanding and not just because they're cheap. Managements with inefficient and substandard operations would fail to qualify under our 15 points. 
Meanwhile, managements of the type that do qualify would almost certainly be finding uses for surplus cash and not just piling it up. How can it happen that earnings retained in the business can be vitally needed yet have no possibility of increasing the value of the stockholder shares? This can occur in one of two ways. One way is when a change in custom or public demand forces each competitive company to spend money on so-called assets, which in no sense increase the volume of business, but which would cause a loss of business if the expenditure had not been made. A retail store installing an expensive air conditioning system is a classic example of this sort of thing. After each competitive store has installed such equipment, no net increase in business will occur. Yet any store which had not met the competitive move might find very few customers on a hot summer day. Since, for some strange reason, our accepted accounting system and the tax laws which are based on it make no differentiation between assets of this type and those which have actually increased the value of the business. The stockholder frequently thinks that he's been badly treated when earnings have not been passed out to him, and yet he can see no increase in value coming to him from what was retained in the business. The managements whose dividend policies win the widest approval among discerning investors are those who hold that a dividend should be raised with the greatest caution and only when there is great probability that it can be maintained. Similarly, only in the gravest of emergencies should such dividends be lowered. It's surprising how many corporate financial officers will approve the paying of one-shot extra dividends. They do this even though such unanticipated extra dividends almost always fail to leave a permanent impact on the market price of their shares. Which should indicate how contrary such policies are to the desires of most long-range investors. As long as dividend policy is consistent, so that investors can plan ahead with some assurance, this whole matter of dividends is a far less important part of the investment picture than might be judged from the endless arguments frequently heard about the relative desirability of this dividend policy or that. The large groups in the financial community that would dispute this view fail to explain the number of stocks that have offered no prospect of anything but below-average yield for years ahead, yet which have done so well for their owners. Actually, dividend considerations should be given the least, not the most, weight by those desiring to select outstanding stocks. Perhaps the most peculiar aspect of this much discussed subject of dividends is that those giving them the least consideration usually end up getting the best dividend return. Worthy of repetition here is that over a span of five to ten years, the best dividend results will come not from the high yield stocks, but from those with the relatively low yield. So profitable are the results of the ventures opened up by exceptional managements that while they still continue the policy of paying out a low proportion of current earnings, the actual number of dollars paid out progressively exceed what could have been obtained from high yield shares. Why shouldn't this logical and natural trend continue in the future? Chapter Eight, Five Don'ts. For investors, one, don't buy into promotional companies. Close to the very heart of successful investing is finding companies which are developing new products and processes or exploiting new markets. Companies that have just started or about to be started are frequently attempting to do just this. Many of them are formed to develop a colorful new invention. Many are started to participate in industries such as electronics, in which there is great growth potential. Another large group is formed to discover mineral or other natural wealth, a field where the rewards for success can be outstanding. For these reasons, young companies not yet earning a profit on their operations may, at first glance, appear to be of investment value. There is another argument which frequently increases interest. This is that by buying now, when the first shares are offered to the public, there is a chance to get in on the ground floor. 
the successful company is now selling at several times the price at which it was originally offered. Therefore, why wait and have somebody else make all this money? Instead, why not use the same methods of inquiry and judgment in finding the outstanding new enterprise now being promoted as can be used in finding the outstanding established corporation? From the investment standpoint, I believe there is a basic matter which puts any company without at least two or three years of commercial operation and one year of operating profit in a completely different category from an established company, even one so small that it may not have more than a million dollars of annual sales. In the established company, all the major functions of the business are currently operating. The investor can observe the company's production, sales, cost accounting, management, teamwork, and all the other aspects of its operations. Perhaps even more important, he can obtain the opinion of other qualified observers who are in a position to observe regularly some or all of these points of relative strength or weakness in the company under consideration. In contrast. When a company is still in the promotional stage, all an investor or anyone else can do is look at a blueprint and guess what the problems and the strong points may be. This is a much more difficult thing to do. It allows a much greater probability of error in the conclusions reached. Actually, it's so difficult to do that no matter how skillful the investor, it makes it impossible to obtain even a fraction of the batting average for selecting outstanding companies. That can be attained if judgment is confined to established operations. All too often, young promotional companies are dominated by one or two individuals who have great talent for certain phases of business procedure, but are lacking in other equally essential talents. They may be superb salesmen, but lack other types of business ability. More often, they are inventors or production men, totally unaware that even the best products need skillful marketing as well as manufacture. The investor is seldom in a position to convince such individuals of the skills missing in themselves or their young organizations. Usually, he's even less in a position to point out to such individuals where such talents may be found. For these reasons, no matter how appealing promotional companies may seem at first glance. I believe their financing should always be left to specialized groups. Such groups have management talent available to bolster up weak spots as unfolding operations uncover them. Those who are not in a position to supply such talent and to convince new managements of the need of taking advantage of such help will find investing in promotional companies largely a disillusioning experience. There are enough spectacular opportunities among established companies that ordinary individual investors should make it a rule never to buy into a promotional enterprise, no matter how attractive it may appear to be. Two. Don't ignore a good stock just because it's traded over the counter. The attractiveness of unlisted stocks versus those listed on a stock exchange is closely related to the marketability of one group as against the other. Everyone should recognize the importance of marketability. Normally, most, if not all, buying should be confined to stocks which can be sold should a reason, either financial or personal, arise for such selling. However, some confusion seems to exist in the minds of investors as to what gives adequate protection in this regard and what does not. This, in turn, gives rise to even more confusion concerning the desirability of those stocks not listed on any exchange. Such stocks are commonly called over-the-counter stocks. It does not mean that, from the standpoint of marketability, a well-known, actively traded stock on the New York Stock Exchange has no advantage over the better over-the-counter stocks. It does mean that the better of these over-the-counter stocks are frequently more liquid than the shares of many of the companies listed on the American Stock Exchange and the various regional stock exchanges. I imagine those connected with the smaller stock exchanges would sincerely disagree with this statement. Nevertheless, I believe an unprejudiced study of the facts would show it to be true. It's why a number of the more progressive of smaller and medium-sized companies have, in recent years, refused to list their stocks on the smaller exchanges. Instead, 
They've chosen the over-the-counter markets until their companies reach a size that would warrant big board, that is, New York Stock Exchange listing. In short, so far as over-the-counter securities are concerned, the rules for the investor are not too different from those for listed securities. First, be very sure that you have picked the right security. Then, be sure you have selected an able and conscientious broker. If an investor is on sound ground in both these respects, he need have no fear of purchasing stock just because it's traded over the counter rather than on an exchange. 3. Don't buy a stock just because you like the tone of its annual report. Investors are not always careful to analyze just what has caused them to buy one stock rather than another. If they did, they might be surprised how often they were influenced by the wording and format of the general comments in a company's annual report to stockholders. This tone of the annual report may reflect the management's philosophies, policies, or goals with as much accuracy as the audited financial statement should reflect the dollars and cents results for the period involved. The annual report may also, however, reflect little more than the skill of the company's public relations department in creating an impression about the company in the public mind. There's no way of telling whether the president has actually written the remarks in an annual report or whether a public relations officer has written them for his signature. Attractive photographs and nicely colored charts do not necessarily reflect a close-knit an able management team working in harmony and with enthusiasm. 4. Don't assume that the high price at which a stock may be selling in relation to earnings is necessarily an indication that further growth in those earnings has largely been already discounted in the price. What is important here is thoroughly understanding the nature of the company with particular reference to what it may be expected to do some years from now. If the earnings spurt that lies ahead is a one-time matter and the nature of the company is not such that comparable new sources of earning growth will be developed when the present one is fully exploited, that is quite a different situation. Then the high price earnings ratio does discount future earnings. This is because when the present spurt is over, the stock will settle back to the same selling price in relation to its earnings as run-of-the-mill shares. However, if the company is deliberately and consistently developing new sources of earning power, and if the industry is one promising to afford equal growth spurts in the future, the price-earnings ratio five or ten years in the future is rather sure to be as much above that of the average stock as it is today. Stocks of this type will frequently be found to be discounting the future much less than many investors believe. This is why some of the stocks that at first glance appear highest priced may, upon analysis, be the biggest bargains. 5. Don't quibble over eighths and quarters. I've used fictitious examples in attempting to make clear various other matters. This time, I'll use an actual example. A little over 20 years ago, a gentleman who in most respects has demonstrated a high order of investment ability wanted to buy 100 shares of a stock listed on the New York Stock Exchange. On the day he decided to buy, the stock closed at 35 and a half. On the following day, it sold repeatedly at that price, but this gentleman would not pay 35 and a half. He decided he might as well save $50. He put his order in at 35. He refused to raise it. The stock never again sold at 35. Today, almost 25 years later, the stock appears to have a particularly bright future. As a result of the stock dividends and splits that have occurred in the intervening years, it is now selling at over 500. In other words, in an attempt to save $50, this investor failed to make at least $46,500. Chapter 9 Five more don'ts for investors. 1. Don't overstress diversification. No investment principle is more widely acclaimed than diversification. 
Some cynics have hinted that this is because the concept is so simple that even stockbrokers can understand it. Be that as it may, there is very little chance of the average investor being influenced to practice insufficient diversification. The horrors of what can happen to those who put all their eggs in one basket are too constantly being expounded. Too few people, however, give sufficient thought to the evils of the other extreme. This is the disadvantage of having eggs in so many baskets that a lot of the eggs don't end up in really attractive baskets, and it's impossible to keep watching all the baskets after the eggs get put into them. For example, among investors with common stock holdings having a market value of a quarter to a half million dollars, the percentage who own twenty-five or more different stocks is appalling. It's not this number of twenty-five or more which itself is appalling. Rather, it's that in the great majority of instances, only a small percentage of such holdings is in attractive stocks about which the investor or his adviser has a high degree of knowledge. Investors have been so oversold on diversification that fear of having too many eggs in one basket has caused them to put far too little into companies they thoroughly know and far too much in others about which they know nothing at all. It never seems to occur to them, much less to their advisers, that buying a company without having sufficient knowledge of it may be even more dangerous than having inadequate diversification. How much diversification is really necessary, and how much is dangerous? It's somewhat like infantrymen stacking rifles. A rifleman cannot get as firm a stack by balancing two rifles as he can by using five or six properly placed. However, he can get just as secure a stack with five as he could with fifty. In this matter of diversification, however, there is one big difference between stacking rifles and common stocks. With rifles, the number needed for a firm stack does not usually depend on the kind of rifle used. With stocks, the nature of the stock itself has a tremendous amount to do with the amount of diversification actually needed. Some companies, such as most of the major chemical manufacturers, have a considerable degree of diversification within the company itself. While all of their products may be classified as chemicals, many of these chemicals may have most of the attributes found in products from completely different industries. Some may have completely different manufacturing problems. They may be sold against different competition to different types of customers. Furthermore, at times when only one type of chemical is involved, the customer group may be such a broad section of industry that a considerable element of internal diversification may still be present. The breadth and depth of a company's management personnel—that is, how far a company has progressed away from one-man management—are also important factors in deciding how much diversification protection is intrinsically needed. Finally. Holdings in highly cyclical industries, that is, those that fluctuate sharply with changes in the state of the business cycle, also inherently require being balanced by somewhat greater diversification than do shares in lines less subject to this type of intermittent fluctuation. This difference between the amount of internal diversification found in stocks makes it impossible to set down hard and fast rules as to the minimum amount of diversification the average investor requires for optimum results. The relationship between the industries involved will also be a factor. For example, an investor with ten stocks in equal amounts. But eight of them, bank stocks, may have completely inadequate diversification. In contrast, the same investor, with each of his ten stocks in a completely different industry, may have far more diversification than he really needs. Two. Don't be afraid of buying on a war scare. Common stocks are usually of greatest interest to people with imagination. Our imagination is staggered by the utter horror of modern war. The result is that every time the international stresses of our world produce either a war scare or an actual war, common stocks reflect it. This is a psychological phenomenon which makes little sense financially. Three, don't forget your Gilbert and Sullivan. 
Gilbert and Sullivan are hardly considered authorities on the stock market. Nevertheless, we might keep in mind their flowers that bloom in the spring tra-la, which, they tell us, have nothing to do with the case. There are certain superficial financial statistics which are frequently given an undeserved degree of attention by many investors. Possibly, it's an exaggeration to say that they completely parallel Gilbert and Sullivan's flowers that bloom in the spring. Instead of saying they have nothing to do with the case, we might say they have very little to do with it. Foremost among such statistics are the price ranges at which a stock has sold in former years. For some reason, the first thing many investors want to see when they're considering buying a particular stock is a table giving the highest and lowest price at which that stock has sold in each of the past five or ten years. They go through a sort of mental mumbo-jumbo and come up with a nice round figure which is the price they're willing to pay for the particular stock. Is this illogical? Is it financially dangerous? The answer to both questions is emphatically yes. It's dangerous because it puts the emphasis on what does not particularly matter and diverts attention from what does matter. This frequently causes investors to pass up a situation in which they would make big profits in order to go into one where the profits will be much smaller. To understand this, we must see why the mental process is so illogical. What makes the price at which a stock sells? It's the composite estimate at that moment of what all those interested think the corrective value of such shares may be. It's the composite appraisal of the outlook for this company by all potential buyers and sellers weighted by the number of shares each buyer or seller is disposed to bid for or offer in relation to a similar appraisal at the same moment of the outlook for other companies with their individual prospects. Occasionally, something like forced liquidation will produce a moderate deviation from this figure. This happens when a large holder presses stock on the market for reasons, such as liquidating an estate or paying off a loan, which may not be directly related to the seller's view of the real value of the shares. However, such pressures usually cause only moderate variation from the composite appraisal of the prevailing price of the shares, since bargain hunters normally step in to take advantage of the situation, which thereby adjusts itself. The point which is of real significance is that the price is based on the current appraisal of the situation. As changes in the affairs of the company become known, these appraisals become correspondingly more or less favorable. In relation to other stocks, these particular shares then move up or down. If the factors appraised were judged correctly, the stock becomes permanently more or less valuable in relation to other stocks. The shares then stay up or down. If more of these same factors continue to develop, they in turn are recognized by the financial community. The stock then goes and stays either further up or down as the case may be. Therefore, the price at which the stock sold four years ago may have little or no real relationship to the price at which it sells today. I headed this subdivision of my comments, Don't Forget Your Gilbert and Sullivan. Perhaps I should have headed it, Don't Be Influenced by What Doesn't Matter. Statistics of former year earnings and particularly of per-share price ranges of these former years quite frequently have nothing to do with the case. 4. Don't fail to consider time as well as price in buying a true growth stock. Let's consider an investment situation that occurs frequently. A company qualifies magnificently as to the standards set up under our 15 points. Furthermore, very important gains in earning power are going to appear about a year from now due to factors about which the financial community is as yet completely unaware. Even more important, there are strong indications that these new sources of earnings are going to grow importantly for at least several years after that. 
Under normal circumstances, this stock would obviously be a buy. However, there's a factor that gives us pause. Success of other ventures in prior years has given this stock so much glamour in the financial world that if it were not for these new and generally unknown influences, the stock might be considered to be reasonably priced around 20 and out of all reason at its present price of 32. Assuming that five years from now, these new influences could easily cause it to be fully worth 75, should we right now pay 32 or 60% more than we believe the stock is worth? There's always the chance that these new developments might not turn out to be as good as we think. There's also the possibility that this stock might sink back to what we consider its real value of 20. Confronted with this situation, many conservative investors would watch quotations closely. If the stock got near 20, they would buy it eagerly. Otherwise, they would leave the shares alone. This happens often enough to be worthy of somewhat closer analysis. Is there anything sacred about our figure of 20? No, because it admittedly does not take into consideration an important element of future value. The factors we know and most others don't know, which we believe will in a few years justify a price of 75. What is really important here is to find a way that we can buy the stock at a price close to the low point at which it will sell from here on in. Our concern is that if we buy at 32, the stock may subsequently go somewhere around 20. This would not alone cause us a temporary loss. More significant, it would mean that if the stock subsequently went to 75, we would have for our money only about 60% of the shares that we could have gotten if we had waited and bought at 20. Assuming that in 20 years, still other new ventures would have given these shares a value not of 75 but of 200, this factor of the total number of shares we could have obtained for our money would prove extremely important. Fortunately, in a situation of this sort, there's another guidepost which may be relied on, even if some of my friends in the insurance and banking worlds seem to regard it as about as safe as trying to walk over water. This is to buy the shares not at a certain price, but at a certain date. From a study of other successful ventures carried through in the past by this same company, we can learn that these ventures were reflected in the stock's price at a particular point in their development. Perhaps it averaged about one month before these ventures reached the pilot plant stage. Assuming that our company's shares are still selling around 32, why not plan to buy these shares five months from today, which will be just one month before the pilot plant goes on stream? Of course, the shares can still go down after that. However, even if we had bought these shares at 20, there would have been no positive guarantee against a further drop. If we have a fair chance of buying at about as low a price as possible, aren't we accomplishing our objective even if we feel that on the basis of the publicly known factors the stock should be lower? Under these circumstances, isn't it safer to decide to buy at a certain date rather than a certain price? Fundamentally, this approach does not ignore the concept of value at all. It only appears to ignore it. Except for the probability that there would be a far greater increase in value coming in the future, it would be just as illogical as some of my financial friends claim it to be to decide to buy on a specific future date rather than at a specific price. However, when the indications are strong that such an increase is coming, deciding the time you will buy rather than the price at which you will buy may bring you a stock about to have extreme further growth at or near the lowest price at which that stock will sell from that time on. After all, this is exactly what you should be trying to do when you make any stock purchase. 5. Don't follow the crowd. There is an important investment concept which is frequently difficult to understand without considerable financial experience. This is because its explanation does not lend itself easily to precise wording. It doesn't lend itself at all to reduction to mathematical formulae. 
Time and again throughout this book, I have touched upon different influences that have resulted in a common stock going up or down in price. A change in net income, a change in a company's management, appearance of a new invention or a new discovery, a change in interest rates or tax laws. These are but a few random examples of conditions that will bring about a rise or fall in the quotations for a particular common stock. All these influences have one thing in common. They are real occurrences in the world about us. They are actions which have happened or are about to happen. Now we come to a very different type of price influence. This is a change which is purely psychological. Nothing has changed in the outside or economic world at all. The great majority of the financial community merely look upon the same circumstances from a different viewpoint than before. As a result of this changed way of appraising the same set of basic facts, they make a changed appraisal of the price or the price earnings ratio they will pay for the same shares. There are fads and styles in the stock market just as there are in women's clothes. These can, for as much as several years at a time, produce distortions in the relationship of existing prices to real values almost as great as those faced by the merchant who can hardly give away a rack full of the highest quality knee-length dresses in a year when fashion decrees that they be worn to the ankle. Investment fads and misinterpretations of facts may run for several months or several years. In the long run, however, realities not only terminate them, but frequently, for a time, cause the affected stocks to go too far in the opposite direction. The ability to see through some majority opinions to find what facts are really there is a trait that can bring rich rewards in the field of common stocks. It's not easy to develop, however, for the composite opinion of those with whom we associate is a powerful influence upon the minds of all of us. There's one factor which all of us can recognize, however, and which can help powerfully in not just following the crowd. This is realization that the financial community is usually slow to recognize a fundamentally changed condition. Unless a big name or a colorful single event is publicly associated with that change, the ABC Company's shares have been selling at a very low price, in spite of the attractiveness of its industry, because it has been badly managed. If a widely known man is put in as the new president, the shares will usually not only respond at once, but will probably over-respond. This is because the time it takes to bring about basic improvement will probably be overlooked in the first enthusiasm. However, if the change to a superb management comes from the brilliance of heretofore little-known executives, months or years may go by during which the company will still have poor financial repute and sell at a low ratio to earnings. Recognizing such situations. Prior to the price spurt that will inevitably accompany the financial community's correction of its appraisal, is one of the first and simplest ways in which the fledgling investor can practice thinking for himself rather than following the crowd. Chapter Ten: How I Go About Finding a Growth Stock. After the publication of the original edition of Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. I began receiving an amazing, to me, number of letters from readers all over the country. One of the most common requests made was for more detailed data about just what an investor or his financial advisor should do to find investments that will lead to spectacular gains in market price. Since there is so much interest in this matter, it may be beneficial to include some comments on this subject here. Doing these things takes a great deal of time. As well as skill and alertness, the small investor may feel a disproportionate amount of work is involved for the sums he has at his disposal. It would be nice, not only for him but also for the large investor, if there were some easy, quick way of selecting bonanza stocks. I strongly doubt that such a way exists. How much time should be spent on these matters is, of course, something each investor must decide for himself in relation to the sums he has available for investment, his interests, and his capabilities. 
I cannot say with any assurance that my method is the only possible system for finding bonanza investments. Nor can I even be completely sure that it's the best method, although, obviously, if I thought some other available approach were better, I wouldn't be using this one. For some years, however, I have followed the steps I'm about to outline in detail. Doing this has worked and worked well for me. Particularly in the highly important earlier stages, someone else with greater background, knowledge, better contacts, or more ability might make some important variations in these methods and attain further improvement in overall results. There are two stages in the following outline, at each of which the quality of the decisions made will have tremendous effect upon the financial results obtained. Everyone will recognize instantly the overwhelming importance of the decision at the second of these two critical points, which is, do I now buy this particular stock or do I not? What may not be as easy to recognize is that right at the start of an organized method for selecting common stocks, decisions must also be made that can have just about as great impact on the chance of uncovering an investment that ten years later will have increased, say, twelve-fold in value rather than one that has not quite doubled. This is the problem that confronts anyone about to start on a quest for a major growth security. There are literally thousands of stocks in dozens of industries that could conceivably qualify as worthy of the most intensive study. You can't be sure about many of them until considerable work has been done. However, no one could possibly have the time to investigate more than a tiny percent of the available field. How do you select the one or the very few stocks to the investigation of which you will devote such time as you have to spare? This is a far more complex problem than it seems. You must make decisions that can easily screen out from investigation situations that a few years later have produced fortunes. You may make decisions that limit your work to rather barren soil, in that, as you gather more data, the outlook appears more and more clear that you are approaching the answer you are bound to find in the overwhelming majority of all investigations. This is that the company is run-of-the-mill, or maybe a little better, but that it just is not the occasional bonanza that leads to spectacular profit. Yet this key decision determines whether, financially speaking, you are prospecting rich or, or poor on the basis of relatively little knowledge of the facts. This is because you must make decisions on what to or what not to spend your time before you have done enough work to have a proper basis for your conclusion. If you have done enough work to have adequate background for your decisions, you will have already spent so much time on each situation that, in effect, you will have made this vital first decision on a snap basis anyway. You just will not have realized that you have done so. There are three things I emphatically do not do. I do not, for reasons that I think will soon become clear, approach anyone in the management at this stage. I don't spend hours and hours going over old annual reports and making minute studies of minor year-by-year -year changes in the balance sheet. I do not ask every stockbroker I know what he thinks of the stock. I will, however, glance over the balance sheet to determine the general nature of the capitalization and financial position. If there is an SEC prospectus, I will read with care those parts covering breakdown of total sales by product lines, competition, degree of officer or other major ownership of common stock. This can also usually be obtained from the proxy statement and all earnings statement figures throwing light on depreciation and depletion, if any, profit margins, extent of research activity, and abnormal or non-recurring costs in prior year's operations. Now I'm ready really to go to work. I will use the scuttlebutt method I have already described just as much as I possibly can. Here, rather than as a source of original ideas for investment, is where the people I have come to know in the business executive scientist group can be of inestimable value. 
I will try to see or reach on the telephone every key customer, supplier, competitor, ex-employee, or scientist in a related field that I know or whom I can approach through mutual friends. However, suppose I still don't know enough people or do not have a friend of a friend who knows enough of the people who can supply me with the required background. What do I do then? Frankly, if I'm not even close to getting much of the information I need, I will give up the investigation and go on to something else. To make big money on investments, it's unnecessary to get some answer to every investment that might be considered. What is necessary is to get the right answer a large proportion of the very small number of times actual purchases are made. For this reason, if way too little background is forthcoming and the prospects for a great deal more is bleak, I believe the intelligent thing to do is to put the matter aside and go on to something else. However, suppose quite a bit of background has become available. You've called on everyone you know or can readily approach but have spotted one or two people who you believe could do much to complete your picture if they would talk freely to you. I wouldn't just walk in on them off the street. Most people, interested as they may be in the industry in which they are engaged, are not inclined to tell to total strangers what they really think about the strong and weak points of a customer, a competitor, or a supplier. I would find out the commercial bank of the people I want to meet. If in matters of this sort you approach a commercial bank that knows you, tell them frankly whom you want to meet and exactly why. It's surprising how obliging most commercial bankers will be in trying to help you, provided you don't bother them too often. It's possibly even more surprising how helpful most businessmen will try to be if you're introduced to them by their regular bankers. Of course, this help will only be forthcoming if the bankers in question have no doubt whatsoever that the information you're seeking is solely for background purposes in determining whether to make an investment and that under no circumstance would you ever embarrass anyone by quoting the source of any derogatory information. If you follow these rules, banking help can, at times, help complete the stage of an investigation that otherwise might never be complete enough to be of any value. It's only after Scuttlebutt has obtained for you a large part of the data that in our chapter on the 15 points I indicated can best be obtained from such sources that you should be ready to take the next step and think about approaching the management. I think it rather important that investors thoroughly understand why this is so. Good managements, those most suitable for outstanding investment, are nearly all quite frank in answering questions about the company's weak points as fully as about its strong points. However, no matter how punctilious a management may be in this respect, no corporate officer in his own self-interest can be expected, unasked, to volunteer some of the most significant matters for you, the investor, to know. How can a vice president, to whom you say, is there anything else you think I, as a prospective investor, should know about your company, give a reply to the effect that the other top members of the management team are doing splendidly, but several years of poor work by the vice president for marketing is beginning to cause weakness in sales. Could he possibly volunteer further that this may not be too important, since young Williams on the marketing staff has outstanding ability, and in another six months he will be in charge and the situation brought back under control? Of course, he could not volunteer these things. However, I've found that if he learns you already know of the marketing weakness, his remark may be diplomatically worded, but with the right type of management and if they have confidence in your judgment, you will be furnished with a realistic answer as to whether anything is or is not being done to remedy weaknesses of this type. In other words... Only by having what Scuttlebutt can give you before you approach management can you know what you should attempt to learn when you visit a company. Without it, you may be unable to determine that most basic of points, the competency of top management itself. In even a medium-sized company, there may be a key management team of as many as five men. You are not apt to meet all of them on your first or second visit. If you do, you'll probably meet some for such a short time you will have no basis for determining their relative ability. 
Frequently, one or two men of the five will be far more able or far less able than the others. Without scuttlebutt to guide you, depending on whom you meet, you may form far too high or far too low an estimate of the entire management. With scuttlebutt, you may have formed a fairly accurate idea of who is particularly strong or particularly weak, and are in a better position to ask to meet the specific officers you may want to know better, thereby satisfying yourself as to whether this scuttlebutt impression is correct. It's my opinion that in almost any field, nothing is worth doing unless it's worth doing right. When it comes to selecting growth stocks, the rewards for proper action are so huge, and the penalty for poor judgment is so great, that it's hard to see why anyone would want to select a growth stock on the basis of superficial knowledge. If an investor wants to go about finding a growth stock properly, I believe one rule he should always follow is this. He should never visit the management of any company he is considering for investment until he has first gathered together at least 50% of all the knowledge he would need to make the investment. If he contacts the management without having done this first, he is in the highly dangerous position of knowing so little of what he should seek that his chance of coming up with the right answer is largely a matter of luck. There's another reason I believe it's so important to get at least half the required knowledge about a company before visiting it. Prominent management and managements in companies and colorful industries get a tremendous number of requests for their time from people in the investment business. Because the price at which their stock sells can have so much significance to them in so many ways, they'll usually devote the time of valuable people to such visitors. However, from company after company, I have heard the same type of comment. To no one will they be rude. But the amount of time furnished by key men, rather than by those who receive financial visitors but make few executive decisions, depends far more on the company's estimate of the competence of the visitor than it does on the size of the financial interest he represents. More important, the degree of willingness to furnish information, that is, how far the company will go in answering specific questions and discussing vital matters, depends overwhelmingly on this estimate of each visitor. Those who just drop in on a company without real advance preparation often have two strikes against them almost before the visit starts. This matter of whom you see is so important that it's wise to go to considerable trouble to be introduced to a management by the right people. An important customer or a major stockholding interest known to management can be an excellent source of introduction to pave the way for a first visit. So can the company's investment banking connections. In any event, those really wanting to get optimum results from their first visit should make sure that those introducing them have a high regard for the visitor and pass the reasons for this good opinion on to the management. Just a few weeks prior to my writing these words, an incident occurred which may illustrate how much preparation I feel should be made prior to a first call on management. I was lunching with two representatives of a major investment firm, one which is the investment banker for two of the handful of companies in which the funds I manage are invested. Knowing the small number of situations I go into and the long time I normally hold them, one of these gentlemen asked me the ratio between the new, to me, companies I visited and the ones of these into which I actually bought. I asked him to guess. He estimated I bought into one for every 250 visited. The other gentleman ventured that it might be one for every 25. Actually, it runs somewhere between one to every two and one to every two and one half. This is not because one out of every two and one-half companies I look at measures up to what I believe are my rather rigorous standards for purchase. If he had substituted companies looked at for companies visited, perhaps one in forty or fifty might be about right. If he had substituted companies considered as possibilities for investigation, whether I actually investigated them or not, then the original estimate of one stock bought for every 250 considered would be rather close to the mark. What he had overlooked 
was that I believe it's so impossible to get much benefit from a plant visit until a great deal of pertinent scuttlebutt work has been done first, and that I have found that scuttlebutt so many times furnishes an accurate forecast of how well a company will measure up to my fifteen points that usually, by the time I'm ready to visit the management, there will be at least a fair chance that I will want to buy into the company. A great many of the less attractive situations will have been weeded out along the way. This about sums up how I go about finding growth stocks. Possibly one fifth of my first investigations start from ideas gleaned from friends in industry, and four fifths from culling what I believe are the more attractive selections of a small number of able investment men. These decisions are frankly a fast snap judgment on which companies I should spend my time investigating and which I should ignore. Then, after a brief scrutiny of a few key points in an SEC prospectus, I will seek scuttlebutt aggressively, constantly working toward how close to our fifteen-point standard the company comes. I'll discard one prospective investment after another along the way. Some because the evidence piles up that they are just run of the mill. Others because I can't get enough evidence to be reasonably sure one way or the other. Only in the occasional case when I have a great amount of favorable data do I then go to the final step of contacting the management. Then, if after meeting with management I find my prior hopes pretty well confirmed and some of my previous fears eased by answers that to me make sense. At last, I am ready to feel I may be rewarded for all my efforts, because I've heard them so many times. I know the objections a few of you will make to this approach. How can anyone be expected to spend this amount of time finding just one investment? Why are not the answers already neatly worked out for me by the first person in the investment business to whom I ask what I should buy? I would ask those with this reaction to look at the world around them. In what other line of activity could you put ten thousand dollars in one year and ten years later, with only occasional checking in the meantime to be sure management continues of high caliber, be able to have an asset worth from forty thousand dollars to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars? This is the kind of reward gained from selecting growth stocks successfully. Is it either logical or reasonable that anyone could do this with an effort no harder than reading a few simply worded brokers' free circulars in the comfort of an armchair one evening a week? Does it make sense that anyone should be able to pick up this type of profit by paying the first investment man he sees a commission of one hundred and thirty-five dollars, which is the New York Stock Exchange charge for buying five hundred shares of stock at twenty dollars per share? So far as I know, no other fields of endeavor offer these huge rewards this easily. Similarly, they cannot be made in the stock market unless you or your investment advisor utilize the same traits that will bring large rewards in any other field of activity. These are great effort combined with ability and enriched by both judgment and vision. If these attributes are employed and something fairly close to the rules laid down in this chapter are used to find companies measuring well on our fifteen-point standard, but not yet enjoying as much status in the financial community as such an appraisal would warrant, the record is crystal clear that fortune-producing growth stocks can be found. However, they cannot be found without hard work, and they cannot be found every day. Chapter Eleven, Summary and Conclusion. Great have been the investment risks of the recent past. Even greater have been the financial rewards for the successful. However, in this field of investment, the risks and rewards of the past hundred years may be small beside those of the next fifty. In these circumstances, it may be well to take stock of our situation. We almost certainly have not conquered the business cycle. We may not even have tamed it. Nevertheless, we have added certain new factors that significantly affect the art of investment in common stocks. One of these is the emergence of modern corporate management, with all that this has done to strengthen the investment characteristics of common shares. Another is the economic harnessing of scientific research and developmental engineering. 
the emergence of these factors has not changed the basic principles of successful common stock investment. It has made them more important than ever. This book has attempted to show what these basic principles are, what type of stock to buy, when to buy it, and most particularly, never to sell it, as long as the company behind the common stock maintains the characteristic of an unusually successful enterprise. It's hoped that those sections dealing with the most common mistakes of many otherwise able investors will prove of some interest. It should be remembered, however, knowing the rules and understanding these common mistakes will do nothing to help those who do not have some degree of patience and self-discipline. One of the ablest investment men I have ever known told me many years ago that in the stock market a good nervous system is even more important than a good head. Perhaps Shakespeare unintentionally summarized the process of successful common stock investment. There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune.